on health and the environment. Members under the chairmanship of Congressman Henry Waxman, Democrat from California, hear about comprehensive proposals to expand access to health benefits, control the cost of health care, and provide for other health care system reforms. A panel of lawmakers and health care analysts testify about various proposed legislative remedies and compare the U.S. health care system with the Canadian one. The meeting of the subcommittee will please come to order. This is the second in a series of hearings that the subcommittee is holding on health care reform. At our first hearing, we received a sobering lesson in the consequences of inaction. If we do not enact health care reform, the cost of health care will continue to rise at a rate of 12 to 15 percent each year over the next five years. These cost increases will make it very difficult for those employers, especially those small employers, that now offer health care coverage to their employees to continue to provide health care coverage. And it will make it even more difficult for those employers, especially those small employers that do not now offer health care benefits, to begin to offer this coverage. This in turn means that there will be more not fewer working Americans and their families without basic health insurance coverage. With more Americans uninsured, hospitals and physicians will have no choice but to shift the costs of caring for the uninsured to those who are insured. Large employers will be able to protect themselves against much of this cost shifting because of their market clout. Small employers, however, will not have the leverage to negotiate low rates with providers. This may prompt even more small employers to drop their coverage. As more Americans become uninsured, it will be impossible for us to achieve our national health objectives for the year 2000. Clearly, the system is broken, and it needs to be fixed. This morning, we are going to hear from various members who have introduced or are about to introduce health care reform proposals on how the system ought to be fixed. These proposals fall into two broad categories, those that would build upon the existing system of employer-based coverage and those that would replace the employer-based system with a public plan, whether Medicare or some other single-payer program. I have introduced H.R. 2535, which is based on the recommendations of the Pepper Commission and which builds on the existing employer-based insurance system. Under this bill, Americans would be covered for basic health care benefits in one of three ways, through their employers, through a new Medicare-like public program, or in the, in the case of the elderly, through Medicare. To control costs, my bill would make public payment rates for services available to private plans. The mixed public-private approach in my legislation is not necessarily inconsistent with the single-payer public plan approach. In fact, through the design of the pay-or-play rules, an employer-based system would be structured so that over time, more and more Americans would be enrolled in a public plan as employers decided it was less expensive to pay a fixed percent of payroll and enroll their employees in the public plan than to play by purchasing private health coverage. The Pepper Commission bill has been introduced in the Senate by the Chairman of the Commission, Senator Jay Rockefeller. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us this morning. However, without objection, I'd like to include in the record at this point a statement from the Senator explaining the Commission's approach. As the Senator's statement makes clear, the need for reform is urgent and the costs of maintaining the status quo are staggering. There are a number of proposals out on the table. Notably absent, of course, is any proposal from the Bush administration. Health care reform just doesn't seem to be a high priority at the White House. Evidently, they are too busy stopping doctors from giving their best advice to patients in public clinics, clinics, too busy outlining politically correct research projects, too busy cutting Medicare physician fees, and too busy telling states how they can spend their own tax dollars. The purpose of this hearing is to help us understand these proposals and how they differ from each other. 
I also hope, however, that this hearing will help us to move to the next stage of developing and enacting legislation that will pass the House. Because we simply cannot afford to do nothing, the costs of inaction are just too high. Before calling on our witnesses, I want to recognize members of the subcommittee for opening statements and recognize Congressman McMillan. Um, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today, as well as others, on health care reform proposals. I look forward to the testimony of our two experts and also our colleagues on bills that they have introduced that would help reform our system. I might just respond uh, briefly to the Chairman's comments about the administration. I uh, really don't think that the solutions to health care in this country are going to be partisan. I think by and large they're going to require uh, bipartisan efforts to get anything done, because if they were truly partisan, then I'm sure that the Democratic Congress would have solved all the problems over the past uh, 40 years that it's dominated the House. So that being said, um, let me point out one approach that I'm taking that's bipartisan. In September, the leaders of in my community, Charlotte, North Carolina, which in, will include uh, active decision makers in, in medical care, uh, beneficiaries, of the business community, even the legal community, will be forming a task force that will examine problems within our health care system uh, in that regional system, and they are a mirror of the national problems, or the national problems are a mirror of the regional systems all across this country. And they will attempt to identify the forces that are driving up health care costs and they will also examine the proposals that members of Congress are introducing and others as potential solutions to the problems of cost and lack of uh, accessibility. Hopefully they will not only be able to uh, uh, address those problems, that, but will also perhaps be willing to face up to some of the difficult trade-offs that are necessary before uh, any uh, health care reform proposal is going to be successful and some of them are extraordinarily difficult, as we know. I believe that any plan to be successful must include several parts. First, it must contain a plan to attack the cost drivers in the system. And these cost drivers include uh, medical uh, malpractice, uh, liability, cost, and especially the indirect defensive medical practices that uh, they engender, the overutilization of services in the system, the unbalanced health insurance practices that raise prices and curtail coverage, excessive overhead of both private and public uh, reimbursement systems, excess hospital capacity, and over-developed um, uh, costly high-tech equipment that uh, is often purchased uh, when we haven't even begun to utilize the last high-tech advance. Second reform must address the problem of the delivery system. If we're able to make health care more affordable, we must also make sure it is also accessible. The working poor typically, typically suffer most from lack of access to health care. Uh, they do not receive preventive services. They delay health care until their health needs are more uh, critical. And then often they have to resort to emergency treatment uh, which is not designed uh, to uh, provide comprehensive care. Third, what we must develop a way to retain and improve the high quality of medical care in this country. And I think we would agree that we probably have the highest quality care of any nation in the world. Research that documents the effectiveness of procedures and that collects and analyzes physicians' practice patterns can provide hospitals and doctors the information they need to provide uh, uh, efficient and effective treatment. With this information, physicians can determine if they perform too many procedures and tests or not enough. But a litigious society uh, mitigates against the exchange of that kind of information because it's too risky to exchange it. With quality standards, we will have another tool in place that will help guide the level of services that physicians provide rather than our current system in which defensive practices determine the level of services. Similarly, this information will make hospitals and physicians compete based on the quality of their care rather than on the basis of how much high-tech equipment they have. 
cost containment, the delivery of health care, quality health care, and quality effectiveness standards must be a part of any rational workable plan. Mr. Chairman, again, I thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to our testimony this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Mr. Steiner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me uh, join with my colleague uh, to commend you again for holding this important hearing. There is no issue before this committee of greater importance to the American public. You know, at our hearing three weeks ago, we heard testimony from CBO Director Reichauer on the strengths and weaknesses of our health care delivery system. CBO noted at that time, and we shouldn't take this lightly, that there are many strengths in the U.S. health care system. A substantial majority, some 85 percent of our population, do indeed have health insurance. For this segment of the population, there is access to care without waiting uh, with a uh, few limits on choice of providers, the type of coverage, and the treatment alternatives. Our societal investment in biomedical research coupled with the current reimbursement system encourage uh, rapid transfer of new technologies that provide the highest quality of care in the world. Now, if I could digress for just a moment, in my view, Friday's vote on the NIH reauthorization bill under your leadership, Henry, expressed very solid support of the House uh, uh, for the principle that the NIH remain at the cutting edge of biomedical research, whether it be in mapping the human genome or expanded research on health of women in critically important, if sensitive, areas of fetal uh, tissue research and research on human sexual behavior. Yet in sharp contrast, to the basic strength of the system, the CBO noted that many believe that our health care system has serious flaws. As Director Reichauer observed, substantial numbers of people remain without health insurance, either private or public, and health care uh, spending per person is much higher than any other countries and is rising faster than the gross national product. Dr. Reichauer went on to note that the dilemma of, prob of addressing problems of cost and access, quote, since policies to address one of these problems may cause a worsening of the other one, we may anticipate further deterioration of insurance coverage or continued rapid increases in spending for health care, unquote. Now, of importance and interdependence between the problems of cost and access have been identified by many. In this regard, I note striking similarities between the CBO testimony and the recent congressional testimony by OMB Director Richard Darman. As Mr. Darman observed, quote, although real per capita health expenditures have been rising dramatically, there are reasons to be disturbed about both the adequacy and the distribution of the return of this increasing investment, unquote. You know, it's often said in the halls of Congress, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, Mr. Chairman, there seems to be a consensus that with regard to our health care system, if it ain't fixed, it will get more broke. Unfortunately, the more broken the system gets, it will translate into human pain and suffering for my constituents in Oklahoma and millions of others across the country. Today's hearing centers on the presentation of alternative proposals of reforming the health care system. The proposals are varied. They range from creation of a national health insurance through a single-payer plan or payer play, joint public-private proposals, state-based reform plans, and the imposition of additional cost and quality control mechanism. Still other proposals alter the balance between financing through taxes and premiums, propose major changes in the role of both public and private insurance, or call for the reform of the malpractice system. I look forward to learning more about the various proposals for reform that there is as yet no clear consensus on the best solution of the problems is reflected in the diversity of the views of my con congressional colleagues who will present their thoughts here today. I'm confident, however, that over time a consensus can be reached. Too much is at stake. For the 33 million Americans with no health insurance and the many millions more with inadequate protection and the businesses, both large and small, that face the ever upward spiral of health care cost. For us not to succeed would really be a crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Sinar. Some weeks ago, I had the opportunity to co-sponsor a briefing on a new book that focuses on the need for health care reform and the implications of alternative public policies. The book, Serious and Unstable Condition, Financing America's Health Care, 
is authored by Dr. Henry Aaron, Director of Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, and he's our first uh, witness today. Dr. Aaron is a nationally recognized economist whose writings about the healthcare sector have helped us better understand the dynamics of healthcare financing and its relationship to other parts of the e economy. We've asked Dr. Aaron to summarize for us his recent analysis of the health system and his assessment of the effects of alternative models that have been offered as reform strategies. Dr. Aaron, we're delighted to have you with us today. Your complete statement will be in the record in full. We'd like to ask if you would to summarize your presentation in around five minutes, as remarkably little time as that may seem, so we'll have a full opportunity for questions and answers. There's a button on the base of the mic. Push it forward, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to repeat my thanks for your uh, kindness in co-hosting that event uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to skip the first two sections of my testimony, partly because uh, the first section has been so neatly summarized by uh, Mr. Sinar, yourself, and Mr. McMillan uh, on the need for action now rather than waiting for a later date. I'm going to skip directly to the third section of, the, uh, of my testimony, in which I uh, divide the uh, menu of health care financing reforms a little more finely than you did in your opening remarks, but uh, the structure is similar. And I try to grade each of four different major options for reform in four different dimensions. The dimensions are, first of all, does the plan assure financial access to care for substantially all Americans? The second issue is, does the plan hold out the promise for cost control? No plan guarantees cost control. It simply creates, may create a mechanism within which control is possible. The third dimension is, does the plan significantly redistribute the costs of current care? The reason I think this is important is that the greater the degree to which any proposal for reform redistributes income ancillary to the main objectives of cost control and assuring access, the less the chance it has for being enacted. Uh, even if you are, as I am, very disturbed about the increasing inequality of income in the United States, it seems to me that the objective of addressing that problem, in this case, is at war with the objective of achieving uh, health care financing reform. The final dimension is the question of whether the plan supports or conflicts with important values embodied in American political and economic institutions. Uh, in these four dimensions, uh, the first of the major approaches to reform, which I describe as incremental, involving modest changes in the private insurance system and some modest ex extensions of Medicaid, I suggest just barely survives failing on the count of access and cost control, that this approach does not offer any credible promise of dealing effectively with these two problems. It does very well on avoiding needless winners and losers, and it may be one reason why this approach is, uh, enjoys a good deal of popularity. And clearly, it is also congruent with existing values as expressed in political economic and economic institutions. So on those scores, it's very easy to continue trying to do what we've been doing in the past, but do it a little better. My fear is that that is the road to higher costs and um, less access, as you suggested. The second general approach is the uh, introduction of a large-scale system of tax credits uh, payable to individuals to defray the cost of health insurance. This approach, it seems to me, ranks either a roaring A or a flat F on the issue of access, depending on the adequacy of the tax credit to cover uh, essentially all of the costs of care and on whether the purchase of care is mandatory or optional. Uh, on the issue of cost control, it seems to me this approach has little chance of achieving major gains because it simply would extend the maladies, the malaise, if you will, in the current health care system that leads to rising costs, uh, specifically the fact that fully insured patients confront fee-for-service physicians, and that's a combination that is guaranteed to give you rising costs. On the needless winners and losers, uh, the uh, 
tax credit approach ranks low because one is going to replace very sizable private outlays with increased taxes, and there is no way that the, you match up uh, those payments. You are inevitably going to produce large numbers of winners and losers. I suggest there's a good deal of value congruence. This fits in well with traditional uh, ways of doing business in the United States. It's a mixed grade. National health insurance, and I've got just a half a minute left, um, ranks very high on access and cost control. It's a, uh, at the bottom of the list on producing needless winners and losers, shifting about $300 billion at a minimum from private budgets to public budgets, and it does violate traditional American ways of handling this particular problem. The final approach is some kind of mandatory employer-financed insurance with a public backup analogous to the, uh, uh, the same category of plan you introduced and uh, others have supported. On the issue of access, I think it ranks a uh, pretty good grade, A minus to B plus. It ranks below national health insurance because it is notably more cumbersome in achieving access. On the issue of cost control, it could be an A if it is combined with effective mechanisms for controlling costs, and I would suggest those are primarily subjecting hospitals to fixed budgets and physicians to fee schedules. Uh, in terms of winners and losers, it ranks a fairly good grade, about a B, maybe a B minus, and on value congruence, it probably ranks a B. The chief strike against it is that it entails um, mandating yet another action by employers or subjecting them to an additional tax, not a popular thing to do. I didn't uh, take a position in, this, in my testimony, although I do in the book uh, presented at the uh, affair that you co-sponsored, on which of these options is uh, the most promising to pursue. Thank you very much for that uh, overview of the options that are available to us. But suppose we decide on no option. Suppose that uh, we wait, we do nothing. Will the access and cost problems in our, that our system now faces get better or worse? And I'm especially interested in what you think would happen to small businesses. I think problems are going to get worse in both, both dimensions, uh, primarily because of the uh, some serious difficulties that are arising with respect to private insurance in the United States. Statistical analysis is getting better and better. Even medical tests are now able to identify candidates for disease with a higher degree of probability, and our accuracy is only going to improve. That means that the ability of insurers to identify high-cost customers and even high-cost groups is becoming strikingly better than it has been in the past. And given the competition in the private insurance industry, there is no way uh, given the forces of competition, an insurer can afford to, ch to charge a customer significantly less than the expected cost they will incur from that customer. That means high cost groups, and there are going to be more small high cost groups because there's more variation from inexpensive to expensive among small groups than among large ones, uh, are going to increasingly find that they cannot afford insurance. They will find they cannot buy it if they have not previously been buying it. They will find that they have to drop insurance or that they will have to sh try to shift costs to employees who will then, if they have the option, reject coverage for themselves or their dependents. So on the uh, access front, I think we face major problems, primarily in the private insurance area. On the issue of cost control, I already said in one sentence what I think the problem is. Fully insured patients meeting fee-for-service physicians are very difficult to control. We are going to try to do so through managed care. My own appraisal of managed care and uh, reading of the reports on its successes and failures to date is that it will achieve significant savings, but that it will not, in the end, blunt the very powerful engine driving up overall costs which arise principally from new medical technology so that we are going to face rising costs and uh, that that is just going to be part of the game down the, down the road. Suppose we come to the conclusion that we can't uh, raise the taxes to put into this system, to have more public funds go into it, either to subsidize those who are not going to be covered through their jobs or to take over 
the responsibility that has been primarily on employers in this country. And suppose we um, decide that we don't want to put the burden on businesses any more than they already have, so that uh, some people now argue that what we should do is reform the small group insurance market by restricting experience rating, prohibiting medical underwriting, and, and they will argue that this will resolve one of the major problems in the healthcare system. My question to you is, won't small group reform standing by itself uh, do the job, or will it make things worse? Uh, I don't think it'll do either. I think it will not do the job, but it will probably make things marginally better than they are today. It will enable some small employers to buy insurance who could not previously buy it. We should understand, though, and I know you do, that uh, large employers are largely self-insured and are moving increasingly in that direction. They have been at the forefront of uh, cost shifting uh, to their employees, not for reasons that are reprehensible, but because of pressures of competition. I'm, I'm not here to criticize or condemn, but simply to report uh, a fact we all know. Uh, they're behaving the way they any smart business executive would behave in a tough uh, market situation. Uh, so uh, the pressures on uh, rising costs are going to continue. Uh, I think we would see some uh, small groups come into the market who are not currently in the market and uh, buy insurance, and there would be a marginal gain. We should remember, though, that insurers have at their disposable, disposal <laughs> a remarkable arsenal of techniques other than price for screening out customers. And uh, by way of anecdote, I will tell you uh, one that was told to me uh, by a uh, manager of an HMO when uh, the market was opened up for Medicare patients. He said, well, we have a very good sales technique for Medicare patients. Uh, we give a dance, a long dance. And at the end of the evening, we make our sales pitch to those who are still there. Well, I'm, I'm interested in your comments. It'll, it will improve marginally the situation. If, um, if we had some insurance reform, that would mean that uh, uh, insurance companies couldn't play some of these games that they now play. But wouldn't the cost continue to rise? And if costs continue to rise, wouldn't that still mean that many small employers that might find insurance afford, uh, attractive now with these reforms still couldn't afford it? And wouldn't it also mean that insurance would rise simply because if we eliminated medical underwriting, the cost for those small groups that are now insured would be increased to reflect the fact that, uh, uh, that, the, that the groups are going to be expanded to some of those high risks, and therefore uh, the cost will go up for those who are uh, now covered who are not particularly as high a risk. Uh, your description of the facts, I think, is exactly accurate, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was operating with an implicit factual assumption, which may be wrong. You and your interpretation could well turn out to be right. Mine was that the primary obstacle, or a primary obstacle right now, the area of greatest price sensitivity would be on those small employers uh, in industries where illness is particularly uh, rife. Uh, if you're a florist, don't apply for health insurance. Uh, or dangerous, a bar or a gas station, would find insurance more affordable and would come, tend to come in, and that that effect would exceed the one to which you made reference. That might not be the case, and uh, your concern that small groups now benefiting from relatively low premiums might drop out in larger numbers than those now subject to high premiums could, would come in could turn out to be the case. You are simply reshuffling an existing pie of costs among uh, a given set of payers. And if you bring in some high cost people, it's going to raise the average price of insurance. Thank you. Mr. McMillan? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, those efforts to um, make uh, group coverage accessible to uh, smaller business are, are important. And uh, there's some good examples of that already taking place um, around the country, which I think the Congress might pick up on. But it's only a small piece of the problem. And I think what, if I interpret what you're saying, the uh, even though you make um, <clears throat> you create access by a smaller business, um, 
you, that leaves a whole group uh, unaddressed that uh, does not participate in that, does not have a chance to participate in that. And the same cost drivers are still in effect. And so that uh, smaller uh, groups that, um, that combine into a larger group are going to be faced with the same cost pressures that your major groups are faced with anyway. That is forcing them to reduce benefits and, and still their costs are, are rising in, in double digit uh, numbers on an annual basis. It's, uh, and, and that's why I think it's so critical, difficult as it is, that Congress not address this simply um, with incremental solutions that don't get at the causes of the problem. Ultimately, we're going to have to face those if we're going to, uh, to achieve anything. And if you, if you would, uh, if, if you are prepared to, I'd be interested in, in your trying to quantify some of those cost drivers. And I know it's extremely difficult to come by, but the whole issue, for example, of, well, let's start with this. We're spending, I think it's been said, uh, the highest per capita of any nation in the world, probably 20% per capita than the next highest, which is Canada, which is supposed to have a total health care system. Something's driving our cost, and even within that 20% higher per capita, we're, we're not meeting a lot of needs. We know that. Something's driving our cost. Um, I've had hospital administrators, for example, uh, estimate that defensive health care costs may be as much as 20% of the total bill out uh, of a hospital. And I've had that from a number of different hospital administrators so that it's not an isolated case. I think the AMA has conceded that defensive practices may amount to um, something in the low teens as a percent of, uh, of physicians. Uh, fees, which may be only the tip of the iceberg in defensive health care costs, but if you could shed some light on that. You mentioned yourself uh, technology, a technology-driven uh, system, and I think that has two aspects. One is, um, is one more sophisticated piece of equipment that only marginally improves our capacity to deliver services over what we've got in place. So you, you were not giving a, a cost-effective uh, uh, analysis of that incremental decision. And the other is the underutilization of, uh, of the capacity we put in place, a cost which has to be absorbed and passed on in the system. Overhead is one that I think you haven't uh, addressed. But let me just stop there. And if you would care to take off on cost drivers, I would I'd be interested in what you've got to say. You've asked a lot of questions. Uh, let me start with a couple of short observations, and in a way it's another response to Mr. Waxman. I think the inevitable response to a small uh, group reform of the kind that is now under consideration is that you're going to be called upon to subsidize those groups, or states will be called upon to subsidize them, in order to offset the additional costs that high-cost groups who come into the system would impose on others. Uh, in other words, to hold current insured groups uh, largely harmless. So I think there's an implicit budget costs down the road. Uh, the difference between the United States would and... That, would that subsidy possibly come in the form of a, a deductibility of premiums which are available in effect to the large group, but not available to the... To individuals, but to uh, small groups now would be... They, are, they have deductibility yes. at the employer level. Um, the difference between the United States and Canada is even larger than the number you suggested. I think it's more on the order of about 35% higher outlays per capita here than in Canada. Uh, the story on malpractice is very complicated, uh, and uh, I can't give you a good quantitative estimate other than those that have been reached by uh, people who have tried to study the effects of malpractice insurance on medical costs. <clears throat> you did not mention direct premium payments, and those can't be a major part of the story because they represent only a, less than one handful of percentage points of total medical costs uh, in the aggregate for hospitals and uh, physicians. Uh, on the issue of defensive medicine, I'm not sure exactly what to make of the uh, report, the anecdotes, the stories that people tell. It exists. It has existed for a long time. It is primarily, if malpractice uh, motivated, a, a problem of certain specialties because malpractice litigation is of dominant importance only in a few specialties. It's not a big deal. 
in most medical specialties in terms of uh, cost or time spent in court. <clears throat> On the issue of um, technological advance, that's terribly complicated. Uh, the, virtually any bit of new medical equipment, major costly medical equipment that one can identify, produces for some patients truly enormous benefits and for others negligible benefits, but the cost is the same. The problem with the current system, which entails essentially complete insurance at the margin, at the time the patient confronts the system, and any insurance-based system will do so, is that there is no mechanism built in that tends to distinguish uh, one from the other. The physician knows if it's beneficial, acting as the agent for the patient, he or she should prescribe the test, the therapy. And the patient, fully insured, says, cost be damned, it's my kid, it's my spouse, it's me, I would like the test, I would like the therapy. So the problem we face is not that we are bringing on stream equipment that is just generally useless. That same uh, MRI scan that saves somebody's life, I was the beneficiary of about six months ago for a test in which the physician said to me, I don't think we're really going to find anything, but it will provide some comfort. You are insured, aren't you? Uh, and he sent me around to have the test. And then he said, he said, you know, he said, I know I'm part of the cost control problem. He was very self-aware. There's no distinction between that and uh, the patient who has uh, suspicion of uh, cerebral hemorrhage or uh, a lesion that might be treatable and where the benefit of the, um, of the uh, test is enormous. It uh, holds out the potential to save lives. The problem with the current system, and indeed of many of the reform proposals, is that they don't attack that root problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sinai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Aaron, in your first paragraph, I think you, uh, you allude to, while I have views on the directions of such reform should take, you're now the health czar, assume for a second. Tell me what those reforms are and how they should be done. Gee, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Uh, my preferred option, not because uh, I view it as the optimum healthcare system in a world in which I could, in which there was no history, uh, is one that does build on the current system uh, through some kind of a player pay mechanism linked to uh, a device uh, which I describe at length in. Uh, um, serious and unstable condition, uh, in which hospitals are subject to fixed budget control administered by a single financial agent for each geographical area. Uh, the reason I think it is important to build on the current system rather than to replace it is, relates to this issue of income redistribution. Healthcare is a $700 billion industry. Uh, members of Congress are uh, having ex ex considerable difficulty persuading themselves and their constituents that notwithstanding the change in world economic conditions, it would be desirable to take $100 billion or $50 billion out of the defense budget, money that nobody thinks brings any good to our society apart from the ability to protect us against a threat that is no longer present. Why is that a problem? because those 50 or 100 billion dollars are jobs. They are facilities in communities. They are the life of communities. If you're talking about massive redistribution of health insurance costs, you're talking about shifts in outlays and in financial responsibility at least as large as that cut in national defense outlays. And that means not just political difficulties uh, as members of your communities come before you and, you say, and say to you, do you know this proposal is going to cost us our hospital? It's going to mean higher taxes for me and my uh, family. You will know who you are affecting directly. And members of, the, of Congress, as you well know, have a hard time dealing with direct and identifiable injury resulting from policies that you may vote for. The more of that there is, the harder 
politically it is to reform, and the less justifiable the reform is. Transition is painful. It results in real losses to people. And for that reason, I think it is genuinely and substantively important Mr. Aaron, to minimize that if possible. Let me ask you some questions. Will there have to be rationing of care under this uh, transition? Initially, I think there will probably not be rationing of care in the sense of denying beneficial care to people who uh, stand to benefit from it. Well, Partly be because of the, reason, uh, of the savings that could be achieved from the kinds of uh, proposals that uh, Congressman McMillan and others have advanced. Well, there Eventually, be, I think there would be. Will there be discrimination between rural and urban areas? There should not be. But uh, in, tra in, in moving through this transition, is it, is it safe to assume or should we put a red flag out that there's a possibility that there will be a discrimination? Red flags will be out by every affected group. You won't have to put them out. Will it, will it affect by age or income brackets? Uh, my answer to that is the same. Uh, I think the elderly will be well protected uh, because they are now well insured relative to the rest of the population. The main concern is going to be to extend benefits to the uninsured among the non-elderly and possibly to improve benefits in certain dimensions for the elderly. That's going to cost some money. Will the uh, system itself, the bureaucracy, be so large that it will uh, collapse on its own weight? One of the benefits from uh, health care financing reform should be simplification of administration. If we don't end up spending less on administration than we now do, you guys have not done your job. Will there be a separate veterans and Indian health care system in this country? I'm sitting on a uh, group of the paralyzed veterans of America right now addressing uh, that specific question. Uh, my own view at this point, and it's a tentative one, is that there should be a separate veterans uh, system uh, on the supply side to make sure that there are, do not exist orphan uh, problems, uh, spinal cord injury notably among them, but that to the degree that veterans can be brought into the mainstream uh, through an insurance system that covers them effectively as it covers everybody else, the need for the current uh, VA system would be reduced. And will there be, one final question, will there be price controls on medicine and medical equipment? I believe that we will end up with limits on fees for physicians. Uh, in the end, I think uh, we will attempt to buy cheaply, to buy smart, as Walter McClure and others have advised in the area of medica medical purchasing, but that we will not resort to price controls. I dearly hope with that we do not resort to price controls. They've never worked very well in this country or any other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Seiner and Dr. Aaron. Thank you very much for your presentation. We look forward to having the members of our committee review your book and uh, try to think through the discussion that you've presented to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our set, second witness is Dr. Stuart Butler, the Director of Domestic and Economic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Dr. Butler has published a number of articles on health policy issues and we have asked him to give us his insights in the problems we face. Dr. Butler, I want to welcome you to our hearing this morning. Your prepared uh, remarks will be m made part of the record in full. We would like to ask if you would to limit the oral presentation to five minutes. Thank you indeed, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to uh, testify before you. As Senator Mitchell remarked in testimony before the House Budget Committee recently, the separation of payment for health care and the receipt of health care has been a major cause of overutilization and endemic inflation in today's system. I would add that the current tax treatment of healthcare spending compounds this problem. The exclusion for company plans certainly has helped millions of Americans to obtain medical care, but it is also grossly inequitable, giving huge tax breaks to high earners with generous company plans and nothing to most Americans without company benefits who must buy coverage themselves. So it's little wonder that there is so much uninsurance among this uh, latter group. Moreover, the exclusion fosters the perverse illusion of free care remarked upon by Senator Mitchell, which turns what is the key to efficiency in the rest of the economy, consumer choice, into the root of the problem in health care. Each of the major health reform proposals tries to deal, uh, tries to reach the goal of universal access while addressing the perverse effects of consumer choice in the current system. In this respect, the proposals can be grouped into three broad approaches. The first is the all-payer or national insurance model, loosely referred to as the Canadian system. 
in this system, consumer choice ceases to determine the supply of services. Instead, government sets the overall budget, government broadly decides how healthcare resources will be distributed and who will receive them, and government, not the consumer, determines value in the system by establishing treatment priorities and setting prices. Such systems undoubtedly are popular in the countries that have adopted them, and they do appear able to keep better control of total healthcare spending than we do. But before adopting such a system, Congress should ponder certain issues. First, establishing a fixed budget without enforcing cost-conscious demand decisions by consumers inevitably leads to the shortages seen in the British and Canadian systems. That means there must be explicit rationing by government. Some societies are more willing to accept government rationing than others. So Congress must consider whether a system of rationing is politically sustainable in the US. Second, Congress must decide if it's comfortable with the idea of running one-eighth of the US economy according to a central planning model rather than a market model. Remember that controlling prices or fees always seems to require ever wider and ever tougher controls, as we are now seeing in Medicare and have for years in, in uh, Canada. Government monopolies or monopsonies also are not normally associated with efficiency, and creating a supposedly objective system of physician worth based on the debunked labor theory of value, as Congress did in revising RVS, in devising RVS, and ultimately would have to, in my opinion, in a Canadian-style system, would be a radical departure from the market principle that value is a subjective notion based on consumer preferences. The second broad approach would be to make healthcare more like the rest of the economy, not less like it. Consumer-based reform models seek to change today's perverse incentives for consumers and use enhanced uh, consumer choice as the primary tool to control total costs and to achieve a more efficient use of resources. Uh, truth in lending, uh, Mr. Chairman, requires me to tell you that I support such a system. Uh, the consumer-based models developed by Heritage and others would replace today's tax exclusion in a budget-neutral way with a system of refundable tax credits in the personal code for all family health expenditures and would require all heads of households to purchase at least a basic family package. Under this system, most tax help would go to those families who really need it to buy health care, and consumers would have a much stronger incentive to choose health plans on the basis of value for money. Such models, of course, also raise issues for Congress to consider. First, can consumers make wise choices in health care? Or would they, as proponents of this system argue, be able to join competing user-friendly groups, such as union-sponsored plans, which could make detailed consumer uh, decisions for them? Second, is consumer choice a potentially effective tool for cost control? In particular, would prices actually charged to consumers have to be so high to encourage efficient choices that they would be a barrier to access? Or, as proponents argue, would the most powerful impact of consumer choice be indirect as plan organizers competing for the consumer dollar uh, force providers to be more efficient? The third approach the third broad approach under consideration covers the so-called play or pay proposals. In these proposals, corporations and government make supply decisions. These plans have the political attraction of seeming to build on the current system. Again, there are several issues to consider. The first is, will the public program be a financial black hole? Under the approach, employers have the right to choose what is in their best interest. The, the size and risk structure of the public program and its cost would be a result of these employer decisions, not, not government decisions. Second, a play or pay system does seem to require powerful anti-discrimination laws to avoid those employers offering insurance from refusing to hire people who would pose med uh, high medical costs. The Mitchell Bill contains very tough anti-discrimination language. But Congress would have to, would, should consider whether the threat of litigation would induce most employers simply to abandon the practice of providing health insurance. If that is the case, play or pay would be unstable as a model and would de degenerate into a national insurance model. Third, Congress needs to assess whether the political process would result in a steady expansion of the basic benefits package, raising costs for firms and for the government. The experience with state mandates, I would point out, is hardly comforting in that regard. Would Congress simply be inundated with provider and labor lobbyists trying to raise uh, the floor for benefits? Uh, these broad observations, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think apply to the proposals before you, and I'd be very happy to either elaborate on them or to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. Let me ask you the same question I asked Dr. Aaron a minute ago. Suppose we do nothing. 
Uh, we don't act on any kind of reform. What are the consequences for those workers who now have coverage for their employers and for those who don't? Well, I think broadly I'd agree with uh, Dr. Aaron on that. Um, and I would just emphasize that I think that the problem of uninsurance will probably get worse, uh, both because of the tendency to drop coverage or to substantially increase deductibles and other, other elements of cost by uh, uh, current employers. Uh, I think there would also be uh, a growing tendency of friction, uh, as we see today, between uh, organized labor and, and management as, organized, as management tries to bring down costs. Meanwhile, employees have little uh, incentive uh, to accept this, uh, but to push to continue or even to expand their benefits. So I think we would see, as, uh, as others have said, a, a worsening of the situation. And that's why I agree, like other witnesses, that uh, we do need very funda fundamental reform in the system. It is broke. Mm -hmm. in, in your testimony, you suggest that a pay or play approach is politically and economically unstable, and it would involve uh, evolve quickly into a tax-financed national health system. Um, I can see th that's an interesting idea. There are other witnesses today who aren't going to be quite so sure, sure that that's the result. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this approach, which is intended to build upon and repair the current system, would lead to national health plans? Well, as I emphasized, I can see the surface attraction, and there's certainly a, a uh, in, in broad terms, trying to build on what you have makes sense. But I do think that, uh, that there are certain very specific dynamics in a pay or play system. As I emphasized, I think you are going to see employers simply, uh, if you like, select, adversely selecting against the government. If they feel that they're better off by shifting the cost to government, they'll do so. Uh, as I also emphasize, and I don't That think might depend, however, on the percentage, uh, the amount of money on, uh, for a payroll tax. Well, it, yes, it would. I don't disagree with that. Uh, but I think the tendency would still be to shift. And I think that the overlooked point that I tried to bring out in my testimony is the question of litigation, because certainly there would be a, a powerful incentive on employers to avoid hiring, particularly at low-paid jobs, people who pose very high medical costs for themselves and, and their family. If that's the case, it seems to me that, that government and the courts are going to look at ways to try to stop this happening. That is going to lead, in my opinion, to the kind of litigation that is, it w which would make the kind of litigation discussed under the Civil Rights Act now under consideration, child's play in comparison because of the cost. So I think the ultimate effect would be that, that very large numbers of employers would shift to that, would shift their employees to the public system, in which case you have essentially an all-payer national system. The Pepper Commission recommended a payer play system, mm -hmm. but uh, that commission also recommended insurance reforms mm -hmm. that would prevent insurance companies from trying to un uh, underwrite uh, uh, the, the risk and try to exclude people. So I'm trying, I find it hard to understand your last point if you think that this is going to be litigation uh, because there's an incentive for small businesses not to hire people who, who, who offer a potential risk. Well, I'm not convinced that, that the kinds of uh, reforms being proposed in the insurance area will sufficiently uh, deal with that issue. They raise other problems too, as I think uh, uh, Dr. Aaron pointed out, in terms of distributing the costs and risk. Uh, but I just don't think they will be that foolproof, if you like. Uh, and all you really need is an employer to feel that there's a significant risk of what could be very expensive litigation uh, based on, on a discrimination suit for there to be a very uh, large shifting of, empl of employees into that public system. I just think that's a, the pattern which is going to be endemic in that system. That's the major the reason factors. then you think there would be a move toward a public system? It's not the, major, it's not the only reason. I just think it's a, a very significant reason because it introduces an, un an uncertainty of potential cost. I mean, an employer can look at what he's paying today and what he projects to pay for current insurance benefits, and he can compare that with a payroll uh, tax. It's much harder for him uh, to compare it with the potential costs of a litigation uh, system, uh, an anti-discrimination system down the road. And so, I, therefore, I think that even when the comparison of payroll cost and existing insurance costs seem to favor that insurance, this other factor will be uh, a powerful inducement to avoid uh, potentially very li large risks by shifting into that uh, public system. How successful do you think Dr. Aaron's notions of cost containment, uh, how successful do you think those, those ideas of cost containment would be in, in, re in, in, uh, in a reducing play costs? System. In a pay or play system? Uh, well, uh, yes. I, I, I think he's over-optimistic, I must say, and I think in, in answer to uh, some of the questions by uh, Mr. Seiner, that, that uh, I do feel that inevitably that system has to impose uh, fee controls. It does have to impose very tight uh, budgets on, on hospitals and so forth. I think it has to. 
And if it does so, it seems to me that it, it has all the, if you like, some, it, it has many of the problems with an all-payer or national system, and yet it retains this, this facade, in my opinion, of an employer-based system, but an employer-based system is where so many of the basic decisions and rules and so forth and fees are set by some other agency. In which case, why have that system? Well, my last question to you is, why do you think your consumer choice idea would lead to control of costs if the consumer really isn't in a bargaining position with the uh, provider who will decide the demand for the service? Well, two reasons. First of all, uh, moving to a consumer-based system at least uh, introduces the notion of the consumer having some incentive uh, to consider cost and benefit, which is clearly not the case today and would not be in, a, in say, a Canadian type of system. The second thing is that, that I, I agree that if a consumer-based system consisted of the consumer, if you like, bargaining with each uh, physician uh, when he's on the operating theatre, in the operating uh, table and so forth, it clearly wouldn't work. Uh, what I think will happen is that in a consumer-based system, there would in fact be a, a tendency for individual consumers to accept very tight limits on their detailed choice of physicians through managed care systems. I think Americans would generally drift in that direction. I think the reason why they're so attracted by the Canadian system is that they place such a high regard on, on uh, simplicity and no bills that they would tend to accept uh, greater degrees of managed care than they do today. And that, I think, would be uh, something that under a consumer-based system would occur naturally, and therefore with less opposition than trying to impose it on them either through an employer-based system or, or some kind of uh, Canadian-style system. Thank you. Mr. McMillan? Dr. Baker, have, um, have you given a lot of attention to the cost drivers in the system? To, to, I'm sorry, to the cost it. drivers in the system? Yes, uh, and, and there are many. Uh, I've emphasized that, that uh, in my testimony and elsewhere that whilst clearly you do have a very different kind of market in healthcare, and certainly the providers of healthcare have a uh, an unusual uh, position to raise costs uh, in the system, and indeed a duty to, as, as Mr. Aaron mentioned in some cases. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, the insurance system has a very different effect in the current system than insurance generally does elsewhere, where if you use your insurance, it raises your own premiums. So I recognize there are big differences. I just think that, that the attitude of the consumer generally in the system adds to all these other problems, indeed compounds them. And that if you're going to get some kind of, of solution to that, short of uh, a Canadian ty type of system that really removes consumer choice as an engine of any kind of, of supply in the system, uh, if, if uh, short of that, you're going to have to have uh, either an, an attempt to try and uh, introduce greater consumer sensitivity, which is what I propose, or, or a very uh, elaborate system of trying to uh, really counter uh, consumer choice decisions made by individual consumers, which is really what you have today, or I believe you would have in a pay or play system. Well, I'm, I'm not an advocate of the Canadian approach, <coughs> but the Canadian approach does get at um, the issue of defensive uh, mm -hmm. practices because of their tort system, which is drastically different from ours. Um, they're more um, uh, on, on the question of technology. They're they're um, um, more CAT scans in uh, San Francisco than they are in Canada. I think it's said, and and uh, you know you can go on and on. Um, they 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 ration um, they ration uh, in effect uh, uh, services, and uh, all of those uh, give them a measure of control. You you are advocating uh, an intriguing approach that I, that I think. Uh, has a lot of uh, merit behind it, but I don't see in it um, the capacity for the system to address the cost drivers so that uh, even though you empower the, the consumer of whatever income to, to provide a, or, or to at least be uh, assisted by the government uh, through either uh, credits or, or actually a direct payment, uh, to enable them to buy that system, they, it doesn't enhance their capacity to exercise a, a discipline over, the, over a market system, as I see it. Well, uh, uh, really, there isn't enough time, obviously, in these hearings to go into great detail about how we would do that. I'd be very happy to give you, provide you with more information on how we do believe that system would work. Uh, but certainly, I think the underlying point that, I'm, that I would try to make is that, really, whatever else you do, 
as I say, short of a Canadian system, which is a very different kind of system than, than anybody is talking about either pay or play or consumer system. Short of that, unless you introduce at least some incentive for consumers to take uh, cost and benefit into account, uh, you're sort of running against the tide with any other kind of proposal that seeks to build on the current system and so forth. And that's a, a point I would make very, very strongly. Now, maybe you feel that given the choice between a consumer-led system and a Canadian system, I'm not saying you personally, but uh, members of Congress may feel that a, cons uh, a Canadian system is, is preferable. But I think it's this area in the middle that's the problem, uh, where you try to build on the current system without fundamentally addressing the question, why would the consumer freely choose to do anything which takes cost and benefit into account in a, in a normal way? Unless you address that, and I think changing the tax system was a, a very powerful way of, of doing that, uh, you're going to run into continuing problems. And that's why I think the pay or play system is inherently unstable as, as a solution to the problem. In your approach, um, I know you haven't had time to mm -hmm. lay it out, but you, you basically are proposing a substitution for <coughs> the existing government reimbursement plan. Well, or maybe you retain system. them. Yes. And then you take the, um, the um, in effect, the tax credit system, the revenue foregone, and spread that over the entire population. In, in a different structure, that's correct. I mean, the, but you don't change the total amount of that credit. You, you, you could or you couldn't, depending on whether you felt it necessary. You but, don't but take a position I, on that. No, I mean, we, we've argued that you take the existing, say, 40, it's about 48 to 50 billion in revenue loss to the tax exclusion and restructure that in the form of tax credits. The, as I emphasized in my testimony, the current tax exclusion gives enormous benefits to people at higher earnings and with, with very generous company plans and, and literally nothing to millions of Americans who are not insured at the place of work. So I'm suggesting changing that into a credit system available through the personal code, which certainly makes it more equitable, uh, gives you help to people who need it. And also, I would point out, it allows people who work for small firms Rather than trying to build a system of, of small business uh, insurance, it would allow employees of those firms to join other groups, other major groups, where there are big economies of scale, as I mentioned, union type of groups, or even employer-provided groups. Other employers might indeed take those people on or, or and get the tax benefits. Individual who's not a part of a group. It's, it's possible, uh, and there would certainly be a, yeah. that would be part of the market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Mr. Denimer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We all have a tendency to uh, postpone, I mean, to avoid postponement of immediate enjoyment and consume our resources, which means that we have a choice between providing the purchase of a premium on a health policy and expending that money for some, what we perceive to be important thing in our life, um, vacation, maybe a second automobile, maybe uh, something outside the health field, I think there's a tendency on human nature, particularly in a country that emphasizes consumption so much as America, to put off buying that policy. Would you comment uh, on the policy option that maybe we will be considering in this country? First off, to say that it is the policy of the United States government that every individual should purchase their own health insurance or provide for their own health coverage. That's a policy, not a mandate. And secondly, to have a mandate that to every citizen must perform that duty, but then we deal with the issue of how to fulfill the mandate. And on that point, I'm talking about arbitrarily fixing a percentage of, just like we provide for our retirement by Social Security, we're required by law to provide for coverage for health insurance through a mandate of a deduction from our salary that would flow into a IRA health savings account with which to purchase health insurance or pay for medical expenses. Would you comment on those two alternatives? Yes. Um, I certainly uh, subscribe to the view that there really must be some kind, I would call it a mandate, uh, on heads of households uh, to obtain at least a basic package. Uh, and in particular for their own, for their dependents, I'd be more concerned about dependents' children than I would be even about an, an adult uh, deciding to take a risk. But certainly I think unless you do that, uh, or make it freely accessible to everybody as a Canadian-style system would do, you would indeed get people, as you pointed out, 
who at the end of the month or at the end of the year would, would uh, take a chance, and they, many do today. Uh, with regard to uh, how you do that uh, and what would be included, I think you ha one way or the other, Congress or some legislature has to make a decision as to what we think as a society is a basic minimum that people ought to have for themselves and particularly for their, um, uh, for their dependents. And that's a, a big question and I think that's what a legislature is for, to make those kinds of broad decisions. As far as an IRA style uh, account, I think that's a useful uh, device. Uh, I support the basic idea of, of putting a money aside in some kind of tax-free account in order to, take, uh, to defray enormous expenditures that might occur in the healthcare area, as in other areas. I'm not sure that it would be a sufficient uh, remedy uh, to the current situation, however. Both, I think that uh, some people simply wouldn't do that. Uh, the kind of tax help that you would provide through that might be a very limited incentive to people at, among, uh, on low income. So whilst I certainly don't, agree with, I don't disagree with it as, a, as an approach, I don't think it's a comprehensive approach. Uh, to a fundamental reform of the system. I had occasion a week or so ago in my area in Southern California to interview the manager of a uh, small clinic that treats people across the age spectrum, including Medicare patients. And uh, she just related to me that uh, since the system of participating, non-participating began three or four years ago. This particular clinic is participating. Mm -hmm. And since that process began, the clinic, when a consumer under the Medicare program comes in to consume a health service, they are not able to require that that recipient pay anything at the time of receiving the service. They must wait until after Medicare reimburses them weeks, months later, before they then can bill that patient for the patient's share, which as I believe is some portion of the 80% that the Medicare allows. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the numbers, Medicare is really re reimbursing a physician under Medicare for less than what a plumber charges to fix our plumbing. And uh, as a result, this particular facility has made the policy decision they're not going to take on any new Medicare patients. And one of the options that this uh, manager suggested that be adopted would be a requirement that when a Medicare beneficiary comes into a facility to consume a doctor's call, uh, that the Medicare beneficiary be required to pay some portion at the point of the consumption of the service up front as some means of discipline on the overconsumption because in this instance they reported that uh, under the prior system when the Medicare beneficiary had to pay a small portion at the time of the consumption of the service they came in three to four times a month now when they don't have to pay anything at the time they consume the service, they come in two to three times a week. Could you comment on that? Yes, I think clearly that the, in the Medicare system and, and other uh, similar systems in, around the world where government is, is underwriting, if you like, part of the cost, there, is, there are these kinds of tendencies within that system and, and they certainly do affect uh, physician decisions, hospital decisions and hospital inclination to take on those kinds of, of, of patients and you're simply seeing that in the, in the clinic that you mentioned. It seems to me that there are really two ways of, of approaching that. One is, as you uh, remarked, to say, uh, well, let us now try to make the person who is eligible under the government program uh, make decisions that are more like people in the pure private sector, which is what they're suggesting. An alternative is to expand the kinds of rules and regulations in the government system to the private sector. So, so the clinic is not in a position to say, uh, I will, in fact, stop doing serving these people and choose these people instead, or, or to shift costs between the two groups, which is also an issue. It seems to me those are the, are the two options that you have, uh, and that it's a question of choosing one or the other. Uh, and I think, as I emphasize, that, that uh, the tendency will be, if you have any kind of substantial uh, government system, as in a pay-or-play system, uh, for the tendency will be for government to extend its rules into the private sector, simply to stop precisely the kind of thing you're referring to, either not uh, serving particular groups or shifting costs between the, the
public and the private programs. I think that's an inevitable result. Thank you, Mr. Denemeyer and Dr. Butler. We thank you very much thank for you. your presentation. Our next panel is made up of members who have each introduced their own uh, comprehensive health care reform bills. While these bills differ, differ, they all share a common approach. They would replace our current employment-based system with a public insurance program, either at the state or the federal level. Uh, we have uh, our colleague from the Energy and Commerce Committee, Representative Markey, who is chairman of the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. He's the author of H.R. 2297, the State Health Reform Opportunity Act of 1991. We also have our colleague from California, Representative Stark, who chairs the Health Subcommittee of the Ways and Means, uh, of the Committee on Ways and Means. He is the author of H.R. 650, the Mediplan Health Care Act of 1991. The gentleman from Florida, Representative Gibbons, chairs the Subcommittee on Trade of the Committee on Ways and Means. He's the author of H.R. 1777, the Medicare Universal Coverage Expansion Act of 1991. Gentleman from Illinois, Ms. Representative Russo, is the author of H.R. 1300, the Universal Health Care Act of 1991. This bill has 49 co-sponsors, including six from the Committee on Energy and Commerce. A uh, uh, lady from Ohio, Representative Okar, who served uh, with me on the Pepper Commission. She is the author of H.R. 8, the Claude Pepper Comprehensive Health Care Act. And uh, finally, the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders, the author of H.R. 2530, the National Health Care and Cost Containment Act. We're pleased to um, welcome you all to our subcommittee hearing today. As I understand it, uh, Representative Gibbons is not going to be able to be with us, and without objection, his statement uh, will be uh, per uh, permitted to be inserted in the record at this point. Let's um, hear from um, uh, Mr. Stark uh, first. Let me indicate to all of you that your prepared statements will be in the record in full. We will, however, uh, uh, be required to limit your uh, presentation to no more than five minutes. We'd like you to cooperate. Thank you. Start. Mr. Chairman, and I, I know that it's your tradition as it is in ours to let members of the committee uh, lead off here, and I had committed to one of our colleagues to attend one of those television things where they rent the time in advance, and I know you'll all appreciate the fact that I dare not be late. Uh, to arrive at B318, and I appreciate uh, your accommodating me by letting me lead off uh, this distinguished panel. I want to thank the chairman uh, for focusing more attention uh, on the problem of the American health care system, which has the dubious accomplishment of leaving 50 to 60 million Americans without adequate protection and uh, ringing up costs in excess of one and a half trillion dollars uh, by the year 2000. Um, if, in fact, there can be no other reason for those of you uh, on the basis of your of social conscience to see that we take care of the uninsured in this country and, indeed, contain costs, uh, look at it this way. Uh, the committee, uh, subcommittee which I chair and uh, is uh, the vice chair, Mr. Russo, by the year 2000 would have a budget under our control slightly in excess of the Pentagon budget and um, we look forward to that, but I'm sure that ought to bring fear to the hearts of many of our colleagues and maybe push them on to do something else. Uh, I have another proposal for getting something done. Uh, it appears that the administration um, has taken a position uh, that can best be summarized as abstinence, celibacy, exercise, and prayer as a way to take care of these 50 million uninsured. And while that may be popular in some quarters, it is not popular in my district. Uh, but I would suggest one thing we could do is we could all uh, pass a bill that says none of us would have health insurance. No member of Congress would have health insurance, nor our staff, until such time as we completed work on this legislation. And I rather suspect we'd shrink that 100 days the President talked about into a very few days because we would then realize the urgency that many Americans feel, not so much, generally they're healthy. So they're not worried about getting to the doctor, they're worried about a financial catastrophe. And um, I think that we could all agree that there are three basic rights in this country. And I've repeated them over and over, but I think they bear repeating. The first one is that every resident in this country, as a matter of right, ought to have health care. 
Uh, and that isn't a constitutional provision now, except for prisoners. And as I've always said, as the gentleman from California will appreciate, the only people who are entitled under the Constitution to medical care are people in the slammer. So if you don't have insurance speed on the freeway in Los Angeles, uh, hit the cop who stops you. You'll need more medical care than you ever dreamed possible, and you'll get it courtesy of Los Angeles County. Uh, I would suspect that there are better ways to do that. The second part of my trilogy is that every provider hospital, doctor, nurse, pharmacist, as a matter of right, ought to have reasonable, not necessarily desired, but reasonable compensation for their services. And third, that we all ought to pay for it according to our ability to pay. And that means a progressive system. The very poor should pay nothing. And those of us who enjoy adequate salaries as members of Congress do should pay substantial amounts for the benefits which we derive from health insurance. Um, a couple of things that I would say, and then just very quickly get to my bill. Uh, I don't think you are going to change the delivery system, politically speaking. Uh, I heard the previous witness and one of the members of the Distinguished Subcommittee inquire as to how we could hold down individuals' purchase of medical care. Individuals don't purchase medical care. They, don't, they like doctors as a, as a phenomenon, but they don't want to go see them. And I would suggest to any of my colleagues here, when the last time is that they spent a Saturday afternoon shopping around for a test that nobody told them they needed and said, just because I can get this test cheap, I'll go buy two. We don't like to go and be stuck with needles or other instruments. We don't like to spend time in hospitals. And rarely do you find someone who voluntarily over uh, medicine, uh, overutilizes the medical system uh, unless they're very, very ill and in pain. Um, so let's not try and change the delivery system. The one system that we probably must change is the payment system. And there I would challenge, as I often do, the members of the committee, the distinguished panel. Most of us can't define what our medical benefits are. We don't know within 80 percent accuracy how many days we get in the hospital. Do our, our kids cover it? How many days of mental health benefits do we get? Does it pay for uh, pharmaceuticals before in the hospital, after the hospital? Vaguely, we know we're covered, but we don't know the specifics. And that's equally true among our citizens. Um, they are not concerned. Um, they, they're only concerned that they have coverage. So what I have suggested, basically, is to take the system which we all know best, and that's Medicare, the most efficient, cost-effective, uh, popular insurance program in the United States, bar none, and uh, expand that to cover all Americans as a basic uh, coverage and allow and affect the uh, private insurance industry to fill in with a supplemental program which cover the deductibles and co-pays. Uh, this would cost an extra $60 billion if you made every employer per year maintain their efforts. And uh, it, you'll hear about lots of programs that are less comprehensive, and you'll hear about some that are more. So I just suggest to the members of the panel, use Medicare as a, as a guide. You want to cut benefits from where Medicare is? I can tell you how much you can save. You want to expand on them? You can find out very easily how much extra it'll cost. Uh, the doctors don't get enough under Medicare. Well, where? I mean, they're all practicing. The hospitals aren't going broke. They all say they are, but they're not. And uh, so I use that as sort of the, as the baseline. And let's expand on that and figure out how we can bring those 50 or 60 million Americans into the system. I, again, want to thank the chairman for his work in this arena uh, and uh, look forward to working with this panel and th this subcommittee in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Stark. I know you have to leave. and We were going to hold questions until after the panel had uh, completed testimonies. Are there any burning questions that any members of the sub? Committee feel they have to ask Mr. Stark before he leaves. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Stark a question if I may. <clears throat> On your third point, you mentioned that the poor should not be required to pay anything. Uh, determining uh, how and what portion that a poor person has to pay is not easy. I, I accept the concept that uh, our society, being humanitarian people, must provide for people who in need of health care who don't have the means to pay for it. But then comes that delicate question, uh, when does an individual with modest resources make a decision to make optional purchases and avoid the payment of 
health care. Well, I think we have to define that. Place the burden on his fellow citizens, and that's a delicate question. I accept that. But wouldn't it make some sense to require that an individual, no matter how poor they are, if they work someplace, they have to take a small portion of their wages and put it aside for the payment of health care expenses when they come along? Well, my bill would anticipate that. I think anybody who's employed um, and has income, say, above the poverty level, um, and I suppose that's eight to ten thousand uh, dollars, ought to put something aside out of each hourly uh, stipend. So th that makes sense, sure. Um, but for many people who are employed part time, that might be a, not a very big amount. But uh, I uh, I would anticipate that working people. Um, might very well have some small portion withheld and those who work full-time and earn more. And where that level is set would be determined, obviously, as we determine it now for Medicaid or other poverty programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Denemeyer. Mr. Stark, we appreciate your testimony. Thank, thank you. you for being with I us. thank the panel for their indulgence. Mr. Markey, I want to hear from you next, and I understand you also are under thank some you. time constraints. I thank the uh, Chairman very much. Uh, for uh, granting me the indulgence of, uh, of testifying before you today. Um, and it is the first time in uh, 15 years on the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee that I have appeared as a witness before the Health uh, Subcommittee. Um, but it has come to my attention, uh, it would be difficult to ignore, that over the last uh, uh, 15 years and more, I'm sure the gentleman from California has been um, an advocate for our comprehensive health, national health insurance uh, plan. Uh, unfortunately, he suffers from that old problem that liberals are usually right, but too soon. And uh, at this particular point in our country's history, I think that uh, more and more people are coming around to the approach which the chairman has uh, uh, advocated for all of these years, which is that we do need a comprehensive national health insurance uh, program. Now, on the one hand, there is a pay or play, which the chairman advocates. On the other hand, there is the uh, a single payer approach, uh, which the gentleman from uh, Illinois uh, supports. Uh, I am a co-sponsor of the Russo uh, legislation. Nonetheless, I would like to make it quite clear at this point, Mr. Chairman, that any legislation uh, of a comprehensive nature which this uh, the subcommittee uh, produces uh, with the uh, gentleman's uh, from California's approbation will have my wholehearted 100% uh, support uh, as my last 15 years as a wholly owned subsidiary of this uh, subcommittee <laughs> in terms of my voting pattern has uh, proven. And nonetheless, I think that uh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois, I think, has very many important uh, uh, ingredients in a formula which he has constructed, which I think does deserve the full consideration of the committee. And as a co-sponsor, I, uh, I support and, and uh, hope it will be uh, uh, adopted. Um, let me say, however, that the legislation which I am uh, uh, here to speak uh, about this morning uh, deals with uh, uh, the observation of Justice uh, Brandeis, which is that the states are the laboratories of democracy. And as a result, we should, in fact, be uh, dealing with the uh, opportunities which we can give to the states, which will allow them to develop uh, uh, in their own individual ways uh, uh, approaches to deal with uh, the health care crisis which is upon our country. Uh, the legislation, H.R. Uh, 2297, uh, which will um, uh, help to remove the obstacles that are keeping states from enacting their own comprehensive cost-effective solutions to the health care crisis. Um, it will assist the states who will no longer have to wait for the federal government to act by providing them with federal waivers that are a critical component to the success of their plan. Uh, to date, no state has yet adopted a single-payer approach, although 20 states are considering proposals that could only be implemented if legislation becomes law. H.R. 2297 involves two simple concepts. First, it provides firm guidance to states to involve business and consumer purchases of health insurance to design a unified statewide health care policy that guarantees universal access to necessary health services, including mental health, 
reduces health care costs by increasing efficiency and reducing paperwork, makes the health care system more user-friendly, and sets a uniform budgetary uh, system and provides equitable program funding. And secondly, the legislation would provide states which enact programs meeting those rigorous criteria with a federal waiver to allow them to implement their universal health care system without losing their share of federal Medicare or Medicaid dollars. Simply put, the bill says that states that are able to reach a consensus on an approach which will cut costs, provide universal access, and assure quality health care should not face a federal roadblock. If they can figure out how to be more efficient in spending federal dollars for all those programs, then we should not prevent them from doing so. The bottom line is that the federal government should no longer stand in the way of states that enact single-payer legislation to solve their health care problems. This point is brought home when we look at the widely acclaimed health care system of Canada. The Canadian health care system began in one province's laboratory, Saskatchewan. One province took the initiative and implemented a single-payer system whose success was so overwhelming that it prompted the Canadians into action, which resulted in their current health care uh, system. My own state, Massachusetts, is one of the 20 states that is currently considering single-payer health uh, legislation. There are 19 others. I believe that if we acted uh, wisely and in an expeditious fashion, along with appropriations of approximately $30 million, a one-time only planning grant uh, authorization, that we could construct a, uh, a, a strategy uh, which would allow for uh, various uh, states' approaches to be uh, given the opportunity uh, to flower and, and, I, and, and in my uh, belief, uh, create the impetus that would ultimately result in a comprehensive na national health care strategy being adopted. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Markey, for thank your you. uh, presentation. In thank you. Intriguing idea that you presented to us. Uh, any uh, quick questions of him? I thank you. I understand you do have to leave. Thank, thank you for you. being with us. Next, uh, let's hear from uh, uh, Ms. Elkar. Mary Rose. Okay. Oh, if you'll wait a second. Okay. Well, I think the next one in line is Mr. Russo, and then we'll get to Ms. Elkar. He's older than I am, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm grayer than you are, too. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to testify before your committee. Everyone agrees that our health care system needs reform. The universal single-payer health care system is the obvious answer to our nation's health care dilemma. And I'm not the only one that has such faith in a universal single-payer system. Both the General Accounting Office and the Congressional Budget Office has testified that a single payer is the only system that can guarantee universal, comprehensive health care to all Americans and do so for less than we spend right now in health care. A single payer system saves because it gets rid of the enormous waste in our increasingly complicated system. My constituents complain constantly about the skyrocketing health insurance premiums and mountains of incomprehensible paperwork generated by our inefficient system. This kind of waste resulted in administrative expenditures estimated between $125 and $160 billion last year. This means up to 24 cents of every dollar spent for health care was wasted on administrative and billing costs. The General Accounting Office reports that shifting to a single-payer system would save the United States $67 billion in administrative costs alone. Insurance overhead would be cut by $34 billion, while hospital and physician administrative costs would be reduced by $33 billion. Furthermore, the GAO anticipates substantial savings through global budgeting, fee schedules, and controls on expensive technology. These savings would not only finance high-quality health care for the uninsured, but would eliminate the heavy burden of co-payments and deductibles on hard-working, middle-income Americans. The legislation I have introduced would implement the key features supported by the GAO in its report. H.R. 1300, the Universal Health Care Act of 1991, would establish a universal single-payer health program which would cut the nation's health care costs while guaranteeing comprehensive, high-quality health care for all Americans. Let me make this clear, Mr. Chairman. My proposal is not the Canadian system. It's an American system. 
It's about the things we as Americans hold dear and have come to expect. Freedom of choice, quality care, and the efficient and quality care and the efficient and fair use of our hard-earned dollars. This bill is about containing costs because Americans can't afford to pay $4,500 for every man, woman, and child by the end of this decade. Above all, it's about giving Americans the peace of mind that they deserve so that when their children are sick, they can take them to the doctor without having to worry about paying a high deductible. Or that when they change jobs, they won't lose their health insurance. Or that when their mother or father needs long-term care, they won't have to mortgage their home or postpone their kids' college education. Partial solutions like insurance reform or mandated benefits won't work because they will allow the insurance companies to continue to administer health care. Insurance companies would continue wasting billions on paperwork and would be unable to implement meaningful cost containment. These, this means costs would continue to skyrocket, pricing more and more Americans out of the health care system. Americans trust and respect their doctors and nurses, but they are fed up with the wasteful way insurance companies manage our health system. Opinion polls indicate that 89% of Americans believe our health system needs fundamental change. Not surprisingly, a recent Wall Street Journal poll found that 62% of voters support a single-payer system, including 60% of conservatives polled. I'm tired of hearing everyone with an inside-the-beltway mentality say that the single-payer is the best system but it could never happen in the United States. The American people want it, and they deserve it. For the amount of money we spend, Americans should be living two years longer than Canadians, not the other way around. H.R. 1300 has supported 50 members of Congress, including three distinguished members of this subcommittee, as well as 10 major unions, Citizens Action, several consumer activist groups, the National Council of Senior Citizens, and the Physicians for a National Health Care Program. My proposal offers the framework for how health reform should be structured to guarantee that America truly has the best health reform system in the world, not just the most expensive. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and all members of your subcommittee, and welcome any suggestions for improving my plan, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Russo. Now I'd like to hear from Ms. Okar. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to congrat congratulate you on your uh, tireless efforts with respect to health care, and especially thank you uh, for uh, including in a previous bill the women's health uh, agenda, at least part of it, and we're very, very grateful. We hope that that um, authorization um, is um, sustained and and hopefully it will be. Mr. Chairman, you and I served on the Pepper Commission together, and over an 18-month period, we, we really studied things that in, instinctively we knew. We knew that a lot of people were uninsured and underinsured. I did not realize that 77 million Americans are non-insured or underinsured in this country, and nobody that I know of has a... a and, and there are eight million who have, need this type of care, nobody that I know of has a decent policy r respective to long-term care, that is homemaker and nursing home care. Uh, and so we have a crisis, and yet Americans spend more. Uh, I think it's instructive to look at what we spend, and these are old statistics, uh, they get um, worse. Uh, we spend 43% more in per capita health costs in Canada, 87% more per capita than West Germany, 132% more on health care per capita than Japan, and yet we're the only country uh, that is industrialized without affordable, accessible health care for every citizen, and I, except South Africa. And I think it's a disgrace, and I think it's a crisis, and in a bipartisan way, if it's possible, we ought to put it on the agenda. So what do I propose uh, in H.R. 8? Uh, I propose a government-based, single-payer plan with a very high standard. I think we have to change the standard of coverage as well, of minimum benefits, which incorporates restricted private sector participation. 
It would be a private-public uh, partnership, and that's how uh, it differs from, in some ways at least, from the Russo plan, because I think we should keep the private sector uh, involved. Let me just go into the contents for a minute. Uh, I think it's very, very important to have uh, coverage related to hospital care, surgery, in and out patient care, et cetera. Um, prevention is very important. There are very few policies uh, that cover child vaccinations, prenatal care, pap smears, mammograms, um, cancer screening for men. Uh, and uh, I also think with respect to prevention, we ought to make a wholesale effort uh, to find a cure for diseases. Why should Americans be spending $90 billion uh, for Alzheimer's disease when if we invested in research, we might be able to cure that disease? So part of preventive health care ought to include, in my judgment, uh, research as well. But most policies don't contain that. And, and as we found from figures in the Pepper Commission, uh, we found that over a three to five year period, when you add those benefits, you save money and save lives. It is not true that you spend more money uh, over a three to five year period when you add prevention. And what about long term care? I honestly think that we need to provide this type of coverage, homemaker and community based care services for our people, including nursing home care. Uh, for at least up to six months since the average person uh, in a nursing home stays there about four months. Uh, we know very well that the good news is that people are living longer, but we have 70-year-old kids taking care of 85-year-old parents, and Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, they just can't do it. We have families who have children with chronic diseases. Why should they have to institutionalize that child when if we had congregate services assisting them with respect to home care and long-term care, that child could stay under the care, loving care of their parents and family? And so having, changing the standards so that you include acute care and long-term care and prevention is what I'm about. Having a single payer is what I'm about. But Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, let me just say this. How do you save money? You save money by having a single payer. You save money by including prevention. You save money by having global state health budgets and having private sector, nonprofit insurance companies bid on this high standard. And by consolidating all of these various governmental programs and, and by not being biased in terms of who serves. We ought to have all licensed health professionals part of the team serving our people instead of just reimbursing the most expensive types of, of individuals. Uh, and I think that uh, ultimately uh, we will succeed. With your help and everybody's banding together as an American problem, we will so find a solution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Oko, for that presentation. Mr. Sanders? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for conducting a hearing on what I suspect is the most serious problem facing the people of the United States. And I think in my own state of Vermont, we have held a number of public hearings in small towns on the health care crisis, and we have been amazed by the number of people who have come out and who have said, the present system is no longer working. We need a major overhaul, no more tinkering. We finally must go to a national health care system which guarantees health care to every man, woman, and child. I'm sure that you are familiar with the enormity of the problem. The system is disintegrating. 35 million Americans today have no health insurance. What happens to those people when illness or accident strikes? 50 million people are underinsured, can go bankrupt as a result of a major illness. We rank 22nd in the world in terms of infant mortality. We rank 12th in the world in terms of life expectancy. Is that being number one in the world? I think not. And after all is said and done for a system which is disintegrating, we end up spending far, far more than any other nation on earth. The Canadians who are in second place are spending 
30 percent less than we are. Clearly, to my mind, the system cannot be tinkered with. We need a major overhaul. We need to do what virtually, virtually every other nation on Earth has done and move toward a national health care system. The proposal that we are bringing forth is, in fact, a Canadian-style system, administratively and politically. As I believe Congressman Russo or Congressman Markey uh, indicated, Canada did not move to national health care full-blown in all of their provinces. It started in Saskatchewan. My own view and what this legislation proposes is federal and legal authority, federal aid, increased federal money, and legal authority for those states in the country which are prepared to move forward now with a single payer system which is comprehensive, covers all health care needs, universal, covers every man, woman, and child in the state, is portable, allows that insurance to go when people uh, go out of their own state. If the state is prepared to do that, they will receive a block grant which brings together Medicare, Medicaid, and additional funding. As others have indicated, it seems to me to be senseless to move forward without eliminating the private health insurance companies right now who are costing this country, according to the General Accounting Office, $67 billion in administrative and bureaucratic waste. We no longer can afford all of the billing excess, all of the bureaucracy, all of the legal fees that presently exist. Physicians for National Health Care estimate that the savings would be $100 billion, and they're using more contemporary figures. The fact of the matter is that we can provide health care, comprehensive health care, for every man, woman, and child without spending one penny more than the $750 billion we're presently spending if we take the money out of paperwork, out of bureaucracy, and we use that to provide health care uh, for our people. Now, this issue of health care, to my mind, Mr. Chairman, is not simply a health-related issue. This is an issue of the political credibility of the United States Congress. It is not an accident that in the last election, 65 percent of the American people did not bother to vote for Congress. The question that the people are asking is, given the enormous problem facing the people of this country in health care and in other areas, is this Congress capable of standing up to the insurance companies, to the drug companies, to the medical specialists, to the medical equipment suppliers, the people who are making billions and billions of dollars off of a system that is disintegrating before our eyes. Now, the beauty of the system that we are proposing is that administratively, it allows the states to move forward. And I believe, as someone who was a mayor for eight years, that I would rather see the single-payer system rest in the hands of the state legislature, of the people of the state, rather than the federal government, which is precisely what goes on in Canada. Also, rather than raising all of the money at the federal level, we give discretion to state governments. California may want to raise uh, their share of the revenue different uh, than the state of Vermont, and we think that's appropriate. Each state should have that option. So essentially what our plan does is provide additional financial help for those states who want to go forward in single-payer, comprehensive, universal care, we give those states the discretion of raising their share in the best way that they uh, believe that they can do it. Uh, so we think that politically, politically, that is a sensible approach for this body. Because quite frankly, although I've been only here for six months, I am not quite sure that tomorrow uh, the United States Congress is prepared to move forward in terms of, of, of a shifting of the tax burden to the tune of many, many hundreds of billions of dollars. So we think administratively, and politically, single payer administered by the states is the proper way to go. We think it's politically feasible. feasible uh, we look forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanders. And I'm pleased that uh, Congressman Gibbons is with us. Uh, we were informed earlier he wasn't going to be here. We have your record, your statement already in the record, but we're delighted to have you here to make a presentation to us. We'd like to ask if you would to limit the oral presentation to no more than five minutes. There's a button on the base of the mic. Please push it forward. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think you ought to know historically how we got where we are today and what I think is the solution to the problem. Uh, Fifty years ago today, I went off to war as a soldier in the United States Army. There was no health care insurance in the United States, no health insurance in the United States. Oh, maybe a couple of union contracts had something like that. 
but there was really relatively nothing. During World War II, in order to keep down inflation, wage and price controls were imposed upon the workers and businesses of this country. But in imposing those controls, uh, they left one door open, and that was fringe benefits. And so during World War II, a system of fringe benefits in order to replace uh, the dollars that the workers weren't getting uh, because of inflation, uh, they, they built up this private health care insurance system that we now have. It's a historic accident. We have let it grow on, and it is, uh, has, has brought uh, disaster to our whole health care system. We have not only the most expensive health care system, uh, we have the most uh, clumsily administered system to work with. Um, but we do have one system that works in this country, and one system for which we already have the laws in place, we already have the administrators of the bureaucracy in place, we have all the regulations written, and the people who use it like it. That's Medicare. So my proposal to this Congress is that we extend Medicare to all people, regardless of age, regardless of their status in life. Some of the characteristics that any health care program for the United States ought to have are, first of all, it should be transportable. It should not be job dependent, as our, as our current system is. It should be open to all, regardless of their current health status or their future health status. And it should be paid for by all. It should be an insurance program just like Medicare is now. Now why use Medicare? Medicare has 35 million participants already. It has been in existence for 26 years. It works. The hospitals know how to use it. The doctors know how to use it. The beneficiaries know how to use it. All the health care suppliers know how to use it. And best of all, we know, or not best of all, but certainly on par with all of that, is that we know how to control cost under Medicare. Unfortunately, under the current Medicare system, we get the most ill people of our population. Uh, and therefore, the Medicare cost, or the medical care cost, are higher than they would be for the entire working population. If Medicare is extended to all people, as I propose, then the cost of medical care would be far less in the United States than under the current system. And everybody uh, would be assured that whenever they got sick, or if they needed preventive health care, or advice, or counseling, they could go to a doctor or to their provider and get that kind of health care. It is not a radical program. It is not a new program. There would still be some area in there for the private insurance industry if uh, they wanted to sell Medigap insurance uh, to take care of those optional procedures uh, that some people desire, or say a private room or something of that sort uh, over a, over a semi-private room as we now offer in Medicare. So there are all these kinds of things that uh, make it attractive to America. It is an American program. It is a proven program. It is one that will save money to the average consumer and taxpayer. It is one that will uh, promote better health for all Americans. Unfortunately, most of the Americans who are now not covered by health insurance are children who really can do nothing about it. And most of them are in families where the father and the mother are both working, or at least one of them is working in a job outside of the home. So uh, we, we have a very vulnerable group of people in America that are not covered. Uh, it is estimated that in a year's time, Mr. Chairman, that about 60 million people are not covered by any kind of health care insurance in the United States. Not just 35 million as we see in those snapshots of one time during the year. So we've got a terrible need in this country. We can solve it by extending Medicare to all. We should do it at once. Thank you very much, Mr. Gibbons. Mr. Gibbons and Mr. Russo, your programs are federally run programs, and Ms. Okar and Mr. Sanders, as I understand it, your programs are federal dollars to go to the states uh, to run the uh, health care system. 
And Ms. Okar, as I understand your proposal, you would cover not only the acute care costs, but the long-term care costs, yes, as would Mr. Russo. But uh, Mr. Sanders and, and uh, Mr. Gibbons do not cover the long-term no, care costs. No, that's not correct. Our plan would cover all, it's a comprehensive plan, as I indicated, covering all health care needs. It would cover nursing homes and... Uh, yes. Just as the Canadian system does, it would cover all basic health care needs, including long-term care. Now, you, you propose to send to the states a certain amount of money that would be the equivalent of, of what? Medicaid, Medicare, plus if all 50 states entered tomorrow, which is highly unlikely, there would be a $45 billion increase in federal help uh, for health care to the states. What our proposal does is eliminate the private insurance premiums that we pay out-of-pocket costs give the states the savings that a single-payer system would entail. In my small state of Vermont, we estimate that to be $200 million. Uh, dollars, and then the state itself, through its own tax system, picks up the rest. Does your uh, uh, bill propose to uh, have the federal government capture the amount of money that would have been spent through the private insurance market through employers, employees, and then after the federal government captures that money to send it to the states? Our proposal allows the states the savings that would be entailed in a single-payer system. The states would capture that. The federal government would raise $45 billion. I'm not talking about the savings. Uh, uh, the savings, the argument would go, is that you'd spend less money if you had a single payer. Right. But there's, uh, most dollars that are spent in the health care area are dollars that are spent without the government being involved right now. Those are employers, cover their employees, the employers right. and the employees. Private insurance money. and so forth. You're going to have this replaced by a government run at the state level, That's health right. insurance. The money then to fund it, would that be raised by the federal government, including the amount that otherwise would have been spent the by the The states would raise, coverage? the people in the state would no longer have to pay all of these private insurance. The state would pick up the tab for that in a way that they felt was best for each individual state. I see. So the states would then seek to raise the funds knowing that businesses in that state are not spending the money they, they had spent before. Well, we would, that's right, but we would give discretion. Obviously, we expect and would believe in my state of Vermont that we'd raise it as progressively as we could. It would mean that IBM would not have to pay private insurance. They would, in all likelihood, have to pay a higher corporate income tax. Individuals might have to pay What other. protection do you have uh, from the idea that states would be pitted against each other by businesses who would threaten to move if they raise taxes and uh, uh, to try to, to fund a more generous health insurance well, we think actually it might almost be the other way about in the, in the sense that it, it makes good sense for business if, in fact, they know that they don't have to pay 20 or 30 percent more every year for private insurance, which is often the case in my state and around the country. So, in fact, as you know, one of the concerns that business in the United States today has in terms of its competitiveness abroad is they are competing against countries which have national health care. So we think that the approach of national health care is really very sensible for business, and those states that go forward uh, will gain from that. Cost containment would be different from state to state? No. What we are doing is while we're giving discretion to the states in terms of how you would raise your revenue in the same sense that Canada does. Some go for income tax, some go for sales tax, and so forth and so on. My preference is progressive uh, <laughs> taxation. Uh, what we do say is that if a state comes into the program, no, it must be single-payer, comprehensive, universal, portable, accessible to all. We don't grant discretion on that. We are not saying to one state, hey, you can do it any way you want, another state, you can do it any way you want. We are giving discretion on how you raise the funds, certain administrative issues, but basically it is comprehensive and universal. Mr. Russo, you do cover long-term care in, in your proposal, mm -hmm. so you would have the federal government take over the acute care insurance for everyone in this country and long-term care for the elderly and disabled. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a comprehensive program, universal, and it's publicly administered at the federal level. Uh, I think uh, what's important is that we get the concept of single payer. Without the concept of single payer, we're not going to be able to save the 80 to $100 billion of administrative waste that's going on today. And if we do that, we can then plow it back into the system to give the kind of comprehensive universal coverage that both uh, that myself and Mary Rose and Barry are talking about. I think uh, it's the only way to give such comprehensive health care to everybody. And the beauty of it all, Mr. Chairman, is that once it's fully implemented, a single-payer system, it saves money. It's 
the only plan that saves money. So you can do everything that I'm talking about doing for less money than the $750 billion that we're spending today. I assume, looking at your plan, there would be no need for private insurance at all, but under Mr. Gibbons' proposal, there would probably be a Medigap insurance market to fill in. Well, there's no one, I don't know what they would offer. I mean, the, there wouldn't be any gap, really, other than private insurance, uh, private room for, that's not medically necessary, cosmetic surgery and over-the-counter drugs. That's all you, 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 if you wanted to buy a policy for that, you could. You would not prohibit private insurance? I would not, but I'd be very frank, Mr. Chairman, I don't know what they could sell. Mm -hmm. Ms. Okar, uh, how is your proposal different from Mr. Sanders, if you know? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, my proposal would be a single-payer uh, proposal that with federal oversight uh, and administration, but the, in terms of the single-payer funneling down to the states, it would also be uh, have oversight over global state health budgets. But the difference is that I honestly believe that competition is good, and if you had nonprofit insurance companies, of which in my city of Cleveland there are none. They're all for profit these days. When I was growing up, most of them uh, were f uh, not for profit. But if you had them bid on this very, very high standard that had federal oversight and single payer, then I as an Ohioan, for example, or you as a Californian, uh, would be able to choose from, as federal employees do today, uh, providing they covered a minimum benefit of, of, of coverage um, from two or three or perhaps even more uh, kinds of uh, policies, providing they fit the guidelines that uh, the federal oversight and single payer uh, would have. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to comment just real quickly on a question you asked Mr. Saunders about who would pay and so on. As you know, it's very instructive, and I could submit this for the record, I'm sure your staff has this, but when you look at the, let's say, the, the uh, cost of health care in this country is $700 billion. I've heard $650, $750. Let's say it's $700 billion uh, for the sake of discussion. It's very interesting to me that the private share, that is, the share that is not public, that is not federal, that is not uh, state or local, is 57 percent, while the public share is about 43 percent, and that has, the public share since 1965 has gone from 24 percent of the pie of health costs to 43 percent, and that to me says that the federal government already does serve people. We already do give veterans benefits in Champus and Medicare and Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera. And the other point that I, would, uh, I think is very, very important is that you ultimately do save money when you have a global state budget uh, and an oversight for that. You save a lot of money, billions, as Mr. Russo and others have mentioned, when you, when you have a single payer uh, and when you consolidate. We are approaching this, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, in a, a piecemeal manner. And it's time to offer a comprehensive health package to people. Uh, and in, in long-term care, I would include all ages. I don't think that is just an elderly problem. I think it's a problem for small children and their families as well who have chronic diseases. So I, I really believe that you could get the health care costs down, that the public part of health care is already in place, uh, and, and that more and more, we are, we are paying for health care in this country, country uh, through the public sector, not the private sector. And finally, as you know, when we looked at that pie in the Pepper Commission, as I recall, uh, of the $700 billion or, or so dollars, about $210 billion was private insurance. A good portion was out-of-pocket expenses, and the rest pretty much was public, the public pie uh, that we already have on a federal and state and local government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank uh, all of you Chairman. for your presentation. Yes, Mr. Russo, one last comment. One last comment, Mr. On. Chairman, because I think this question of costs and how we're going to pay for the system is something that needs to be addressed. And I think 
uh, under the single payer system and uh, the replacement cost for health care premiums versus taxes is, is the most progressive way of doing it. But let me just deal with this whole idea of we don't have enough money to do health care. There is no greater emergency facing the American public today than health care. And whenever we have an emergency, the President has the authority to put it off budget and do it. For example, the SNLs, that's a great emergency. We're going to spend anywhere between 150 to $250 billion in addition to what we're spending today to save the, the thrift industry. That's off budget. We're paying for it. How are we paying for it? An interest cost on a national debt. But we're paying for it. It's a, it's a need that we said we have to deal with. Desert Storm was, it, was important for a lot of people to save the Kuwaitis, a great democratic uh, uh, government over there that's suppressing its people and killing its people and kicking them out. We did it for all whatever good reasons we did it for. We're spending about 65 to $68 billion on that. And on Star Wars, the so-called brilliant pebbles. The brilliant pebbles in this country are young people who need better health care. We ought to be spending money on them. Those are the brilliant pebbles that we ought to deal with. They are the thousand points of light that we ought to give some battery juice to so they can start lighting up the skies for us. Instead, we say that's not an emergency. So therefore, you, the Congress, got to figure out a way of paying for it. There are a lot of ways of paying for it. The most important is to understand that there is an emergency and we ought to band together, both Democrats and Republicans alike, and solve this emergency just as we're solving the SNL, just as we solve the problem with Desert Storm, just as we solve the problem with the HUD scandals. We have the obligation to the American public to solve this problem, not wait five or six or seven years down the line. We've got to solve it today. And don't worry about the cost. There's dollars there to do it. And whenever we run short, Mr. Chairman, just declare an emergency, kick it off budget, and we can solve it. Chairman, if I can have a last, last word. Very yes, briefly. very last word. I don't think that there's a whole lot of debate anymore that single payer is what is cost effective, is what is sensible, and is what is the fair thing to do. And I really think that the issue is do we as a Congress, as a government, have the courage to take on some very politically powerful people in the insurance industry in the pharmaceutical industry, in the AMA, who have tremendous power. We know that. Do you object if it's done at the federal level? I think what, I agree with 85 percent of what Mr. Russo is saying. The critique is right, and believe me, if we moved in that direction, I would be a very happy guy. I would prefer to move at the statewide level. But in either case, we're taking on the same political opponents who are very, very powerful. Let me just have the last word because I'm the chairman. <laughs> You're committed. You have it. I think we all want the same objective. And that's that every American be covered for health care services. People shouldn't go without because they can't afford to pay for it. And we've got to make this a high priority because if we don't deal with this problem, not only are the injustices magnified, but the current system is something we can't sustain. The costs are too great. We haven't been able to contain the costs. And uh, therefore, people go without coverage. And those who do have coverage are paying exorbitant amounts for that coverage. What we need to do is to figure out how to get to that point, whether it's a state level, whether it's a federal level, whether we phase it in maybe uh, with a, a pay or play until we get there. These are things that we're going to have to discuss. But I want to commend uh, each and, and every one of you for saying to us, this is the direction we have to take. This is a problem we can no longer ignore. And I thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Our next uh, panel consists of members who have introduced health care reform legislation that builds upon our existing employment-based system. While these bills are unlike the pay-or-play approach that the Pepper Commission recommended and that I've sponsored, they do uh, not contemplate the replacement of private employer-based coverage with a public plan. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. P, sits on both the Budget and the Ways and Means Committee. He is the author of H.R. 1255, the Universal Health Insurance Act of 1991. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Sabo, serves on both the Appropriations and Budget Committees. He's the author of H.R. 2114, the Comprehensive Health Care Improvement Act of 1991. We're pleased to have both of you with us today. Your uh, prepared statements are going to be in the record in full. What we'd like to ask if you would do is to limit the oral presentation to no more than five minutes. And Mr. Pease, why don't we start with you? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, I <clears throat> arrived a few minutes early and heard some of the previous testimony, and it's clear from that testimony and from everything that's published 
that the key question before your committee in the Congress is whether to go for a comprehensive, <clears throat> all-inclusive system or to go to a system which targets those who are most in need, those who have no health insurance at all. <clears throat> and within that choice, the next choice is whether to go with the existing health care delivery system and build upon that or to go to a single-payer system. My choice, which I first came to about eight years ago, uh, was or is to <clears throat> use the existing health care delivery system and to target those who do not have any health insurance at all. <clears throat> and that's essentially what my bill does. It would create for each state or, or parts of large states <clears throat> an area the federal government would seek bids from all health insurance purveyors uh, as to which one would bid the lowest price for a set <clears throat> system of, or set regimen of benefits. Federal government would award a contract to one of those companies in each state. That company would be guaranteed 60% of all of the business. <clears throat> then uh, <clears throat> a rule would be that the insurance company would have to take anybody who sought insurance, no exclusions whatsoever. Then the federal government <clears throat> would issue uh, to anybody who asked it, asked for it a, a uh, voucher, good for one of these insurance policies. The person would pay 6% <clears throat> of his or her income, no matter what that income might be, for the voucher. The remaining uh, part of the cost, which would be considerable, would be picked up uh, by the federal government. <clears throat> Employers would be allowed to make use of this system if they wished, uh, provide uh, insurance for their own employees. If they fail to do so, uh, we would have a, <clears throat> a tax on those employers, which would help to pay for the overall system. This, <clears throat> in my view, is the sort of thing which is most likely within the grasp of the Congress. I have told people that I sort of expect that we will have a national health system at some point, but that I don't know how to get from here to there, considering the cost of a comprehensive system, considering the ferocious opposition that we would meet from the medical fraternity, from the insurance industry, and from conservative groups. So I have chosen this approach for what I think is a workable way to deal within the existing system and make health insurance accessible to those 35 or 30 million, 37 million people who do not have it today. I commend it to your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Pease. Very interesting okay. approach. Mr. Sabo? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate this opportunity to appear on the question of uh, of uh, Access and cost of health insurance in this country. I I think it is one of our most troubling problems today Frankly, I think it's been one of the most troubling problems for a number of years uh, My interest in this issue is uh, Not really been sparked uh, by my involvement in Congress, but rather in earlier years as a member of state legislature when the mid 70s uh, we passed a a state uh, catastrophic health insurance plan and a state pool uh, and we succeeded in those. And, uh, and uh, in my judgment, uh, from that experience, I, I thought that there were several things we could do to substantially ease the problem of health care access we have in this country. My judgment, there are two access uh, pr problems. One is access for individuals who don't fit into uh, uh, normal group insurance. Secondly, is access for many small businesses who increasingly have difficult time uh, uh, finding someone to offer insurance to them. In my judgment, uh, the way we could have the quickest impact in, in making health insurance accessible is one, mandating that uh, employers offer insurance, which is, my, which is what my bill does for all employers of uh, 10 or more. 
having state pools which offer access uh, to individuals and to businesses which uh, cannot buy normal group insurance uh, coverage. Uh, I frankly in my bill do not get into the question of a uh, premium sp split between employer and employee. I have no particular philosophical problem if we get into it and we can pass it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, my judgment is that even if we cannot move to legislating that premium split, there would be substantial benefit to mandating the offering of insurance by employers. Uh, my observation has been that uh, that lessens the political opposition from smaller employers. Uh, and I think the fact also is that the nature of the tax code uh, where health insurance premiums are a non-taxable income to the employee uh, would uh, quickly encourage uh, the, the negotiation between an employer and employee to, uh, to have the employer pay a portion of the premium without it uh, being uh, uh, mandated. Uh, I would also suggest, uh, and we do in our bill, uh, that we place greater emphasis on having a children's benefit option only within group insurance. Uh, the numbers are there. The bulk of the uninsured are children. Yet most group insurance plans offer uh, the option of self-coverage and dependent coverage. Dependent coverage basically assuming an adult plus kids. Uh, the premium split normally is the employer pays more for the, for the employee, less for dependent coverage. Uh, the fact is today uh, we have uh, most, most, uh, uh, most couples, both parents are working. In many cases it's a single parent household. And they simply have to, under our group ins insurance premium arrangements, uh, have to buy coverage in effect for an other adult simply to cover their kids. Uh, my judgment, we could substantially access, uh, increase the access of kids to health insurance by making sure that a children's only option was included under group insurance. Uh, the question of cost control. Uh, I, don't, I don't know any simple answer to that one. Uh, as we struggled in the mid-70s in our legislature, the same question was before us. Before you do anything, control cost. Uh, we did. We passed certificate of need at that time on the state level. My own judgment, we made a mistake at the federal level. I think my state made a mistake as they repealed certificate of need. That was re relatively modest in comparison to some of the proposals I hear today. Uh, I thought that was good legislation, should have stayed on the books. Uh, uh, we did have extensive health care or health planning legislation on the books. Uh, that's all disappeared in the early 80s. I thought uh, th 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 that method of dealing with health care costs uh, was helpful. I am convinced that, however, as we approach the future, and uh, what we have in a bi our bill is a provision that requires states to establish a system for judging quality of health care. Uh, if we're going to deal with that question, I think we have to put increased emphasis on having a mechanism whereby people can uh, make judgments on quality of health care offered. Uh, if it's simply regulating costs uh, per bed, per fee, uh, I don't think it's to the heart of the problem. I think the evidence is there uh, that uh, somebody may have a more expensive per procedure uh, charge, but if uh, the, the effectiveness of that procedure is substantially better than other providers, uh, clearly that's something that controls costs. I think a component of health care costs, containment then, has to be heavy emphasis on, on quality of care. I heard the bell ring. Let me simply say that in our bill we also provide money, and we raise money. Uh, we suggest that on the payroll tax for Medicare, which we currently cut off at 125000 I know no good reason why we should cut it off at 125000 uh, We make all of earned income subject to that tax. Raises about $4 billion. We say that is available for a new senior catastrophic plan. We do not try to define it. We leave that to your, your and other committee's judgment. I also know no reason why the Medicare tax should apply only to earned income and not to unearned income. We apply that tax to all unearned income, 
raises about uh, $10 billion, refund that to the states on a per capita basis, about a little over $40 per capita, which they can use for two purposes. One, to subsidize the operation of a state pool to keep it competitive, and secondly, for the states to uh, create a sliding fee scale uh, program for low-income people to buy into uh, the health insurance program. We do not uh, mandate uh, state share, but we allow the states to supplement the federal dollars. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. So as, as I understand your proposal, you would mandate insurance for the working people in this country where they have uh, uh, an employer with 10 or more employees. Is that, is that correct? That is right. Y and, um, and then for those who are not in the workforce, you would have some money, but not uh, spelled out entitlement for, uh, as we understood the, the, uh, the We term. would allow the states to have flexibility. They would have the option of buying into the state pool. In our state currently, we have a state pool currently since the mid-70s. It's basically for people who have health problems and can't purchase insurance for health reasons. I simply would make that uh, state insurance pool uh, make eligibility for it simply the inability or uh, the fact that you want to buy in. So those would be individuals who are not in the workforce buying into right. it? Would that state pool cover those people with pre-existing conditions that are working, or would they be covered by their jobs? Uh, we provide that for pre-existing conditions in the state pool that there's a six-month waiting period. You virtually have to do that for adverse uh, selection. Do you provide for insurance reforms? Or no. simply an employer mandate? Uh, we provide uh, for, I'm not quite sure what you mean by insurance reform. Well, in other words, but would the I employers be mandated to buy private insurance? Pardon me? Would employers be mandated yes, to buy? Yes, they would be mandated to provide uh, uh, private insurance, and uh, we define uh, minimum benefits, which are rather comprehensive, and would define, uh, require the state pool uh, to, uh, to uh, offer similar benefits. But let me, let me go to one other point in the operation. There are states with state pools. And generally, a very difficult question is how you subsidize losses of that state pool to keep the premiums relatively competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the one works in our state is assessment on other insurers, which, has a, which is probably has some merit, but involves a fundamental problem that the state cannot make, put that requirement on, on, uh, on insurance policies covered by ERISA, uh, namely uh, the self-insured multi-employer contracts. And uh, that's why we provide some of these federal funds can be used for the ad that operation of that state pool. Uh, our experience, frankly, in Minnesota in the mid-70s in dealing with this problem was that ERISA created all kinds of problems for us. Uh, it, it created problems for us in how to to manage the operation of the state pool and sharing uh, uh, the extra risks there. Uh, we also wanted to mandate uh, that at uh, the point that uh, you left an employer that an option had to be to receive a conversion policy that had equivalent benefits. Again, we could not do that for, for companies covered or plans covered under ERISA. Uh, we wanted to mandate uh, extensive benefits in ex existing programs in terms of making sure that uh, the private plans had catastrophic uh, coverage. Again, we could not do it for ERISA-covered uh, covered programs, so that uh, uh, ERISA ended up being a real roadblock uh, for us in the state doing the things we wanted to do in the mid-70s. And, and then what do you propose to do about the ERISA issue now, to have the I, states be able to reach all those plans? I do not. <laughs> I am not an expert in ERISA. I see. And uh, I just think it's a, I, I, if you move in any direction that involves state options, uh, which I think is a more practical direction to move in, if you move in the direction of state pools, uh, if you have cost sharing in those states. But you pools, leave it to the states then? I would leave it yeah. with the states. Now, uh, let I me think ask you, you have uh, to look at ERISA. Let me ask in, you one In other terms of state plans versus federal plans, I, I tend to be skeptical about one uniform national plan mm -hmm. that. Uh, I think that would become very bureaucratic. Uh, I would much prefer a state option. Mr. Pease, your, your proposal would be to have a pool, in effect, negotiate a pool, 
pooling arrangement that would be run by the private sector after negotiation with government. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, <clears throat> essentially so, Mr. Chairman. The government would seek bids from any bidder, Blue Cross, private insurance companies, to provide to any, any comers a certain level of medical benefits in a standard hospitalization policy. And the government would award the bid, and the companies would provide the coverage. Neither of you uh, man mandate that people get coverage. Is that right? If people decided not to get coverage, uh, that's their choice. That's correct. At least in my case, it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I don't know how you you can you can provide the opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure how you require them to do it if they choose not to. And that, I suppose, true under our existing plan would be under this plan. Yeah. I, I might say that, uh, frankly, one of the things is I was looking at this issue again this year, uh, discovered that actually, in terms of COBRA, we've done a number of things which I think most folks are not aware of. One of the other groups that tends to be highly uninsured are young adults uh, who uh, have lost their group eligibility. Uh, under their parents' plan, I discovered that uh, I think it's for three years that they could get those, continue those same benefits at, uh, by paying additional premiums and uh, have equivalent benefits. Uh, uh, my sense is that lots of people are not aware of that option. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Denemeyer? <clears throat> I have no questions. Of these two distinguished gentlemen, thank you. Let me just ask one last question. Uh, what do you do with the people that aren't insured? How, do you, how, do you, uh, how should we deal with the cost of care for those people who decide not to, not to insure themselves? I'm not sure. I, uh, I do not know a good answer to that. Uh, some may uh, refuse to for a variety of reasons. I assume they're ultimately responsible for uh, uh, their bills if they have no assets, uh, then uh, in some way the public becomes involved. Frankly, that was one of the reasons in Minnesota in the mid-70s we passed a, a catastrophic plan that applied to everyone, but the deductibles were very, very high. I think, as I recall, they were 40 percent of first 15,000 of income, 15, 50 percent between 15 and 25, and 60 over 25. Uh, and uh, that plan ensured that nobody was totally annihilated by major illness. But the deductibles were so high that it encouraged people, in effect, to have other insurance. But there was this backup plan in case someone didn't or that the uh, costs went beyond, uh, substantially beyond the cost of their normal, uh, normal uh, coverage. Mr. Chairman, I think the medical costs of those who, are, who choose not to participate in this system essentially will be born the same way they are now in the emergency room through private uh, pay <clears throat> with bill collectors and all the rest. And I would hope that a relatively small percentage of people would choose, would, would choose out of the system. But I, I do think, as Mr. Sable said, that some element of, uh, of free choice is really essential to the sort of thing that we have in mind. Well, I want to thank both of you for your uh, very interesting, present, uh, interesting proposals and your presentation to us. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Our uh, final panel was to consist of two of our colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, one of them will not be able to be with us because uh, his plane is delayed. But we do have with us our colleague, uh, Representative Johnson from Connecticut, who is a member of the Committee on Ways and Means and has introduced H.R. 1565, the Health Equity and Access Reform Today Act of 1991. We want to welcome you to our subcommittee uh, hearing today. Your prepared statement will have in the record in full. We'd like to ask if you would to uh, limit the oral presentation to five minutes. And Mr. Uh, Grandy, Representative Grandy, who's also a member of the Committee on uh, Ways and Means, introduced H.R. 1230, the Universal Health Benefits Empowerment and Partnership Act of 1991. Uh, and unfortunately, he's not able to be with us. But without objection, we will have his uh, prepared statement in the record. Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding these hearings and for giving uh, members an opportunity uh, to share our thoughts with you. 
Uh, I think as we approach this larger discussion, it's very, very important to take into account the experience that we have already had from the national level in controlling health care costs. The VA system is a perfect example of federal control and federal cost containment. In the VA system, we have controlled costs through the budget mechanism and finally ultimately controlled costs by eliminating a whole group of veterans who had access to that system. In the Medicaid system, we have controlled costs by reducing fees so dramatically that without any question at all, access has been severely limited and quality compromised. As we go into this discussion, I think that experience of how we as a government have sought to provide care and then sought to control costs is very relevant. Before I get into my comments on solutions, let me make two brief comments that I enlarge on in my testimony on other ideas that are out there. First of all, uh, the mandatory pay or play system. In a nation with a vital small business sector, where the small businesses are the job drivers of our economy. It is very important that we not compromise the ability of people to create small businesses and, in fact, to go out of, of, out of business. If we impose on them a heavy cost, we will certainly have a very dramatic impact on the structure and shape of our small business sector. I personally believe there are options to mandating and ensuring, ensuring responsibility on small businesses, particularly when it is very clear that small businesses would love to provide health insurance uh, for their employees. It is a disadvantage not to be able to do that in terms of competing in the labor market. They don't provide health insurance for the same reason that many small businesses that did provide health insurance no longer do. It's simply too expensive and it is not possible to predict the cost uh, growth in that, in that benefit, and therefore employers uh, are reluctant to get into the business to begin with, even if they could afford it right now, because they're afraid in two or three years they'll have to withdraw that benefit, and they don't uh, want to have to be in that position. So I think it's important to recognize that small business would love to provide uh, health benefits, and they don't for good reason, and we ought to be very careful before we mandate on them an expense that we cannot control and that they can certainly not control and that will clearly be the difference between being alive and being dead as a small business. So the pay or play system I think raises some very serious issues uh, for us. Uh, furthermore, it does create some inequities. I mean, under the Senator Mitchell's pay or play provisions, if my husband works for someone and I work for someone, I cannot have access to his dependent, to his program, even if it's better than mine. And if my employer decides to pay instead of play, then I'm part of the state minimum benefit pool, and I, that may not have very good benefits, particularly for women and children, but I will no longer have the right to be covered under his insurance. So I think there's some serious problems um, with the pay or play approach, as I think there are serious problems with the Canadian approach, uh, and I think we must move carefully. Because those issues are of profound importance to us and will have an enormous impact on the structure of our economic activity as well as on our health care system, I believe the debate on those issues will be time consuming, years consuming, and that in fact there are larger issues that prevent radical reform from happening now. But there are things that we can do now there are seven things in my estimation that we can do now and that we must in good conscience do now because they will materially expand access. And in good conscience, I don't think we can afford not to do those things that we know will expand access for the uninsured. Secondly, they will turn the cost vectors in a different direction. We know that. We don't know how much when we do these things systemically, but we have good reason to believe that the effect will be significant. Therefore, in three years or so, when the national debate matures, we will also be able to see the consequences of the immediate actions that we have taken to affect access and cost, and be in a much better position, therefore, to make judgments about what ma further macro moves we want to take. By that time, we may be talking about 20% of our economy. You know, you don't alter the rules that govern 20% of the nation's economic activity without, um, without um, some uh, trepidation. 
So the seven things that I want to briefly recommend to you, and you know a lot about them, so I'm not going to go into details. I just want to hit some high points that I think haven't been hit. S reform of the small group health insurance market is, in my estimation, doable this year. We know enough about it, and it clearly would create access for about two-thirds of the uninsured, the one-third that makes more than 200% of income. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, and their dependents. Uh, my, the, the form that the small group reform takes in my bill, if I could infringe on my colleague, Mr. Grandy's time, <laughs> um, because my small group reform... I understand reform, he would want to yield it to you, so go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> One of my, uh, uh, my bill is different in terms of its reform of the small group uh, sector in two regards. First of all, it is the only one that creates a competitive market. And I think that's important. If we're going to have small group reform, we ought not to have one plan out there. We ought to have a way of creating a variety of plans so there'll be some choice. Uh, secondly, uh, in my small group uh, reform, the role of the federal government is not unlike it is in the Medigap insurance reform proposal adopted a year ago. It's the federal government that says these plans must meet these criteria. And one of them is limiting the right to exclude for pre-existing con condition. Uh, conditions, limiting rate variations, guaranteeing renewal, guaranteeing eligibility, uh, requiring public disclosure. So I think some of the problems that most plague that market and most frustrate our, our constituents should be addressed as part of the small group reform and the model of Medigap reform is, a, is an important one. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, I want to call your attention to the bill that Rod Chandler and I introduced uh, that uses the COSY model in Cleveland to uh, allow groups of small employers to band together. And as a larger group, lower rates by bargaining uh, costs. Our bill would relieve them of premium taxes. Uh, our bill would allow them to accrue those 30 percent reduction in administrative costs and go uh, beyond that because they would be also uh, able to use the ERISA exemption and write their own plan. So the combination of the Chandler-Johnson Cozy Bill and the Johnson-Chandler Small Business Reforms does create the possibility of reducing by at least 50 percent the cost of uh, small group health insurance in America. And I think that's a formidable challenge uh, to us to look at. Tax code reform so the self-employed are treated the same as larger employers so that we only reward health insurance plans that promote smart buying is another major change that we could make this year. Expanding community health care centers is terribly important and addressing the tort reform problems that are eating up a lot of our community health center money. Let me just say one, one extra word here on com expanding community health centers because you asked my colleague, Mr. Sabo, how to deal with the uninsured under his program. Under my bill, there would be since I don't mandate insurance, although I do mandate that small businesses must educate their employees about this new market of uh, small group plans, uh, there would be some that don't choose or can't afford insurance. My vision of the expansion of the community, migrant, uh, health, community and migrant health centers is not just expansion. I mean, I see that as the public uh, uh, health system out there in the future so that there wouldn't be a town in which people who can't afford insurance wouldn't have access. The centers can charge on a sliding scale fee. We should have some way other than the emergency room that people throughout America and rural and urban communities can always reach basic health care. And I think our community health uh, center system uh, demonstrates the power of such an approach to really create universal access. Mrs. Johnson, let me yeah. ask you some questions and maybe the Fine. And other the last one is liability reform. Yep. And then we'll go so ahead. The, the, um, so you have tax code changes, liability reform, uh, community health centers to pick up Expansion. some of the public needs uh, that are not maybe otherwise covered. But the heart of what you're suggesting is reform in the insurance market. No, that's not the heart of it. With that, it's the combination of reform in the insurance and expansion of the community health center. The two together can reach everyone. Right. Now let's look at the, the insurance reform aspect of it. Uh, you would eliminate the underwriting of insurance, private insurance, wouldn't you? No pre-existing yes. conditions, exclusions? I, yes. The, I, I limit... You would set up standards that all of them would have to meet. Right. You would say that they have to cover everybody who's willing to pay 
the same fee. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Not the same fee because it would be a competitive market so that there would be a number of basic plans they could choose from. But if, if a person wanted to choose a particular plan, they wouldn't be charged more because they are a higher risk to be no, sick. Correct. Okay. Um, our first witness was Dr. Henry Aaron, and I asked him whether he thought if we had this kind of insurance reform, but didn't require small businesses to, to provide insurance coverage, whether this might not increase the amount of money that's paid for private insurance by those who now are covered because they're going to bring in some people that are a little bit more riskier uh, and more costly to treat uh, in the insurance, through these insurance reforms. What, what do you think about uh, of well, that we, issue? I asked that question at a hearing. And, and, the, and, and, and thereby, maybe right. some of these employers dropping their insurance because well, it got a little, right. a little bit more expensive. The answer I got back was that 80% of the premiums in that small group market would go up. Now, if you go to community rating, uh, I think the answer was 80% if you went to community rating. I go to a constraint on rate variations. And so the um, uh, rates don't go up that much, but they go, do go up probably 30 to 40%. If you eliminate medical underwriting, you eliminate the right of insurance companies to charge a relatively low rate for well people. But it's, the, it's that kind of underwriting that has created such a churning in our market and uh, put small businesses at such a disadvantage. So I think we should move in this direction, and I think by combining what's in that bill with what's in the COSI bill, we can really keep, um, because in the COSI bill, we also eliminate the premium taxes, which also reduces costs. So I think there are ways that we can restructure that market, but also encourage the kind of participation that will drive costs down. By mandating that small businesses educate their employees about the insurance possibilities that are out there, I think two things will happen. First of all, more of those people will stretch themselves to take it, and more small employers will say, gee, I can't do the whole thing, but I could do so and so amount per month. If we mandate pay or play, like in Massachusetts, and you're getting up to $1,600 per employee, uh, then you're going to get, then that, that kind of money, not all small businesses can afford, but some small businesses can afford uh, something that would make a material difference to their employees if the policy out there they're trying to buy is affordable. What do you do to hold down health care costs themselves? Um, do you have any policies other than the malpractice uh, insurance, ref malpractice yes. tort reform that you're proposing? Uh, there are three ways in which my bill works to, to hold down health care costs by increasing access through the small business reform, the community health center reform, and treating self-employed as employers, you reduce cost shifting dramatically. And so that's a cost driver. Malpractice reform not only um, should have a, a real impact on defensive medicine costs as well as uh, transaction costs, but I also changed the tax code to encourage what I call smart buying. We would no longer provide public subsidies for plans that were uh, benefit rich with no participation. I believe that everybody ought to be part of this, issue, this uh, purchasing uh, of health care and be sensitive, therefore, to its costs, although my plan does exempt co-payments for uh, well child care and prenatal care. I think there's a place there for preventive care to be exempted from co a co-paid structure. But my bill would change the tax code so that your plan would have to be co-paid, structured, or managed care structured, or finally dollar capped in order to qualify. You could have your choice of any one of those. But we would no longer provide tax benefits to the plans that were developed in the 60s and that are insensitive to costs. So you would have a plan that would be offered that would either be a managed care plan or one where there's a copay requirement for services, and those would be the only ones permitted to, to be offered to employees. So there is also a, a safe harbor provision that mm -hmm. provides a dollar amount. If your plan was a dollar, met this dollar amount, which is set in the bill at about what it costs now in most plans for, sell, for family insurance or Do you provide a minimum insurance. set of benefits that must be provided in each plan? Pardon? Do you provide a minimum set of benefits for each plan? No, I don't. So it seems to me that you may be encouraging insurance companies to offer uh, a, a smaller, a, a less expensive plan, but also 
benefits that may be inadequate. Well, in, the, in that particular sector, of course, the state mandates still govern. So and you would I leave the states to, to mandate? Well, uh, 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 under the tax code, the difference that we would make is that we'd begin to say to people, you have to look at whether your plan is encouraging people to buy needed care and appropriate care or any care. And we, we now insist that you find some way to help differentiate between those two. It's not a clean line, but we only have the choice of controlling costs by trying to push out of the system inappropriate care. Our only other alternative is to price manage the system. And we price manage Medicaid, we price manage VA, we are now price managing Medicare, and frankly to price manage from Washington is going to be about as effective as price managing from Moscow. Simple. You do leave Medicare and Medicaid in this bill, I do, because I think that's part of that next level of discussion that will create greater system equity mm -hmm. and I think eventually result in Medicaid being an insurance program on the basis of income and uh, dealing perhaps differently with long-term care. Thank you very much. Mr. Denemeyer? Can you uh, give us an idea as to whether or not uh, the plan that you're talking about, your plan or the plan you've worked with uh, Rod Chandler, or grandees, any one of those three, uh, would they result in any additional cost to the federal government? Uh, probably initially, but I don't think in you, the long term. Do you have an term. estimate of what that would I, be? We, we, don't, we don't actually have an estimate, but for instance, we know that it will cost a fair amount to treat the self-employed person the same as the employed person. And how would this cost, CBO, how, how would the federal government incur this additional cost? Well, by, through the, um, the subsidies that we would provide for the, the self-employed person to have the same tax benefits that now a larger employers enjoy. That'd be kind of a tax credit sort. Right. Uh, on the other hand, we would target the existing tax credits. The problem is that CBO won't talk to us about what that would save. Have you asked the Joint Tax Committee to give you an <laughs> estimate of what it would cost? Neither of them will talk about what these things will save because no one uh, wants to say what, what, the, what the additional cost to the federal government is from your plan. Uh, we don't have an estimate yet, back yet on that. We have asked for it some months ago. We don't have it how, back. All right, next question is, how about the additional cost to the state governments from your plan? Uh, there's no additional cost to the state governments okay. from our plan. If there should be savings to the state government. I understand your, your concept, and I, I want to commend you for it, is that uh, rather than put the burden on the employer, in our country to provide insurance. If I understand what you're talking about, you want to have the employee have the responsibility of obtaining insurance himself or herself. Is that what you're talking about? Well, ultimately, and we struggle with this in my bill, ultimately, I would like to say five years after the situation is, in, the, the system is in place, the individual would have the responsibility either to have insurance or be registered with a community health clinic. But until you have these community health centers more established and more broadly based in our society, how you can't you, require how, the individual to have that responsibility. How, how, would you, how would you enforce this requirement that an individual have their own insurance? Well, you know, at first I think you want to take as non-punitive approach as you can and you simply m perhaps put on the 1040 a little box that you check saying that uh, I have insurance or I am registered with the community health center. What if, what if a person doesn't? What do we do? Uh, you know, ultimately, if a person doesn't, then when they get sick, they go to the center, they pay on a sliding scale fee. If they come to the hospital, eventually Medicaid would provide them with a sliding scale fee coverage. But yeah. their income would always be taken into account. So ultimately, if they neglect their health and have to go to higher cost care, uh, they get referred back through, they, first of all, they pick up their share of the cost, and they get referred back through the system. A lot of people would not go to higher cost care if there were really good community health care available, but there isn't. See, so uh, ultimately, I think we can have the individual take that responsibility and then see what portion of that problem we need to crank down on. But I certainly wouldn't want to mandate that an individual uh, carry insurance when the insurance is not now affordable. Uh, the kind of solution that the, the Senator Mitchell uh, offers is that we subsidize the premium yeah, so it will be bill, affordable. You, you bypass state mandates in your bill, don't you? Uh, in the COSI proposal bypasses state mandates, and I in my bill bypass state mandates for the small group market. I think it is really an outrage in America that we allow big businesses to bypass small, uh, state mandates well, and not small businesses. That's right. I agree with you on that. 
And furthermore, there's no evidence, though that's gone on many years, that businesses are choosing an irresponsibly small a, a number of benefits. Uh, I think that's really important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dannemeyer. Uh, Ms. John Ms. Johnson, thank you for your, your testimony. It's an interesting proposal that you have, and I look forward to discussing thank with you. you further. That, uh, if I may, just a few comments here. I have a plan that I've been working on for some time. May I make brief re reference to it? Gentleman's recognized. Uh, we feel we feel withhold. You bet. I've waited until everyone else has had a chance because I felt that they had, you know, an opportunity to come and share these thoughts with us. This uh, this plan I've been working on for about the last year and a half, and I've been able to obtain some figures from the Joint Tax Committee so as to <clears throat> make the claim with credibility that it's revenue neutral. And what it does is place a limitation on the deductibility of health premiums paid by an employer and the amount of that deductibility that would be limited would be roughly $3,695 for family and the limitation on the deductibility for a single employee would employee would be $1,478. Now, the limitation on deductibility produces a large amount of revenue. In fact, over, over five years, it produces an additional revenue to the federal government of $86.1 billion. It's a lot of money. And then we spend that money in two different ways. One, to establish a health IRA for individuals who would be eligible to uh, establish a 33% credit for up to $825 in contributions to a medical care savings account. That is to say, if they contributed $825 to a Health IRA, they would have a tax credit of a third of that, which would be $275. And from that Health IRA, they could make expenses for health care costs that are incurred by that person. And for a, for a couple, that amount that they could achieve a credit for and contributions to a health IRA would be $1,650. So they could take a third of that, which would be $550. That would be a credit against their tax. And then we also would give a tax credit of a third of the premiums paid on a health policy. And the amount of the credit would vary by age group of the person who bought it. The person is aged 20 to 29 would have a 33% of a tax credit of $350, a third of that. 30 to 39, a third of $500. A 40 to 49, $750. 50 to 59, a third of $1,250. And 60 to 64, a third of $1,500. And over 65, a third of $2,000. Now the motivation from this is that it gives an incentive to these people today that are not currently covered by insurance across this country. The numbers have been estimated to be 30 to 40 to 50 million people, many of whom are working or are in families where people do work. And this would give them an incentive to purchase a basic health policy. Um, both from the standpoint of the tax credit on the payment of the premium for the policy as well as the establishment of a health IRA. And the, the Joint Tax Committee has estimated that those who would take advantage of the establishment of the health IRA would consume about $78 billion over the next five years, and the 33% tax credit would consume about $8.1 billion over the next five years. So the money that is saved by limiting the deductibility on premiums paid by large corporations, some $86.1 billion over five years would be spent in these two ways. So that we would, in this plan, it would be revenue neutral. No additional cost to the federal government, and given the fact that we're adding four-tenths of a trillion in the national debt this year, 
I think any plan that comes along that talks about solving the problems of health care in, in America must address the fact that, frankly, the federal government just doesn't have the additional resources to add on to the existing expenditure stream. Something's got to give to replace it. Then another important feature of this plan is it bypasses state mandates. As I think the gentleman from California is aware, state legislatures around the country have required that any health care policy sold in the state must include coverage for a lot of things that are desirable, but from the standpoint of basic coverage, drive up the cost of the premium. And as you know, under ERISA, the self-employed can bypass state mandates. And so this plan lets states establish a basic health care policy that would bypass state mandates, and in so doing, we have estimates that the cost of the premium for that bare bones or basic coverage would be substantially less than what they have to pay today. So this is the essence of the plan, and I'd ask unanimous consent that a summary of this be introduced or introduced into the record, and I'll be introducing this uh, bill in the in the House uh, in the next day or so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Danamai. Without objection, a summary of that uh, proposal will be inserted in the record. That concludes our hearing for today. We stand adjourned. That concludes this hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee. If you would like additional information about the issues discussed during the meeting, you can contact the panel's offices at 2415 Rayburn Office Building. That's in Washington, D.C., and the zip code is 20515. Coming up next, we bring you a Cato Institute forum looking at the Reagan tax cuts 10 years later. From the nation's capital, you're watching C-SPAN 2. The cable satellite public affairs networks are nonprofit cooperatives created and supported by the National Cable Television.